Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the DN What If, with another fanfiction. This is the second part of What If Deku Becomes a Military Commander. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Shigaraki's frustration echoed through the devastated USJ as he confronted the unexpected turn of events. The once triumphant atmosphere now hung heavy with the realization that his grand attack had crumbled beneath the claws and fangs of wild predators. Kirajiri observed his young master's tantrum with a resigned air. Young master, it appears that the hero students have devised an unforeseen counter-strategy. The animals you see have single-handedly decimated our forces. The villains were not prepared for such a wild and brutal resistance. Shigaraki, still seething, glared at the lifeless bodies scattered around. Animals I can't believe it. We lost to a bunch of animals. The irony wasn't lost on him. Villains, armed with quirks and schemes, defeated by the primal force of nature. Aizawa, restrained within the Namu's grip, couldn't help but feel a mixture of relief and horror. Relief that his students were unharmed, but horror at the unexpected and savage nature of their defenders. The realization dawned upon him. Midoriya Orkota, one of his students, was controlling these creatures with ruthless efficiency. Meanwhile, Shigaraki's voice reverberated through the crumbling ruins. What's the point of all this planning if it comes down to wild animals attacking us? His anger was a volatile mixture of frustration and disbelief. The meticulously orchestrated attack had unraveled in the face of a force he hadn't considered. Hirajiri tried to maintain a semblance of composure. Young master, we may need to consider a strategic retreat. Reinforcements are on their way, and we are not equipped to handle these unforeseen adversaries. Shigaraki's scowl deepened. Retreat. No, I won't accept that. I won't let them think they beat us. His hands twitched, the urge to disintegrate something growing stronger. The League of Villains' grand entrance had turned into an embarrassing retreat. All thanks to the intervention of nature's own warriors. As the situation unfolded, Aizawa quietly contemplated the unexpected alliance between his students and the animal kingdom. The chaos of the USJ attack had revealed a new facet of their capabilities. A wild, untamed force that had left the League of Villains reeling. Amidst the ruins, Shigaraki wrestled with the reality that his carefully crafted plan had crumbled beneath the ferocity of animals, leaving him no choice but to face the consequences of a failed assault. The howls and roars of the victorious creatures served as a testament to the resilience of nature against the machinations of villains. Izuku, standing amidst the gathering of predators, felt a surge of determination. The villains before him, perhaps caught off guard by the sudden appearance of this untamed force, now faced an impending threat they had not anticipated. He swiftly turned on his earpiece, a direct line of communication to his tactical team. Men, I want those with the normal snipers to already leave the USJ. The one with the armor will stay until the ringleader either has retreated, dead, or captured, Izuku commanded with authority. Five affirmatives resonated through the earpiece, signaling their acknowledgement and compliance. Satisfied with the response, Izuku seized the earpiece, his grip tightening until the device crumbled beneath his fingers. It was a symbolic gesture, severing the link to external orders and fully committing to the battle that lay ahead. As he surveyed the plaza, Izuku's sharp senses detected a lingering threat, a villain attempting to capitalize on the distraction. Swiftly raising his Act 205, he unleashed a barrage of gunfire, the rapid succession of shots finding their mark. The once advancing foe now lay defeated, a testament to Izuku's unyielding resolve and tactical prowess. With the immediate threat neutralized, Izuku refocused on the primary adversaries. His force of bears, wolves, and crocodiles awaited his command, a disciplined and patient assembly of nature's might. The ominous growls and snarls emanating from the animal allies echoed through the air, creating an aura of tension that permeated the battlefield. Now, all of you, attack the big one first. Now go, Izuku directed with unwavering determination. The predators, responding to their master's command, surged forward as a cohesive unit. The grizzly bears, their massive frames charging with primal intensity, led the charge. The polar bears, sleek and powerful, followed suit, their icy gaze fixed upon the looming abomination. The Eurasian wolves, embodying a collective strength, weaved through the chaos with calculated ferocity. Alongside them, the Nile crocodiles, formidable and ancient, slithered towards the central threat. Izuku, the orchestrator of this natural symphony, moved with purpose, flanking the advancing force of predators. The villains, now confronted by a force beyond their expectations, struggled to comprehend the unconventional assault. The sheer power of the animal kingdom, harnessed and wielded by a hero with a mission, threatened to dismantle their malevolent ambitions. The USJ Plaza, once a battleground, 
now bore witness to a clash of primal forces, one that would determine the fate of heroism and the resilience of those who dared to stand against the tide of villainy. As Shigaraki's meltdown echoed through the USJ, an abrupt interruption came in the form of gunshots echoing in the distance. The League of Villains leader turned his attention towards the unforeseen threat. What he witnessed left him momentarily frozen. His eyes widened behind the hand mask that concealed his face. The unleashed animals, led by Izuku's strategic command, were closing in, revealing a raw, untamed power that defied his earlier dismissal. Realization struck Shigaraki like a jolt. Perhaps labeling these animals as weak was a grievous understatement. The visceral scene unfolding before him painted a vivid picture of primal dominance. As the beast closed in on his forces, Shigaraki's earlier arrogance crumbled into a mixture of shock and fear. The initial shockwaves of laughter that had emanated from him were silenced, replaced by an unsettling uncertainty. In a desperate attempt to regain control of the situation, Shigaraki screamed, Namo, kill them, the Namo. An engineered monstrosity designed to take on the symbol of peace himself, responded with a guttural noise. In an instant, it confronted the approaching animal force. The grizzly bears, with their formidable stature, lunged at the Namu, attempting to strike a blow. However, the Namu's lightning-fast reflexes proved insurmountable. Its colossal fist tore through the stomach of one grizzly bear, abruptly severing Izuku's connection to the fallen creature. The second grizzly met a similar fate, followed swiftly by the third. A lone Eurasian wolf leaped towards the Namu. But its fate was sealed as the Namu seized the wolf's head and crushed it with an overwhelming display of strength. Shigaraki, witnessing the annihilation of the animals he had once deemed inferior, erupted into laughter once more. Huh, against normal villains they might have worked, but this one is made to beat all might. You can forget even beating it. Dumbass animals, Shigaraki gloated, his confidence seemingly restored. A Nile crocodile became the next casualty, flattened under the Namu's relentless assault. As a polar bear faced a gruesome demise, Izuku observed the carnage with an unreadable expression. The animals, valiant in their attempt, were falling one by one to the overpowering Namu. In the midst of the chaos, Izuku, acknowledging the inevitability of the animal's defeat, calmly hummed to himself. Psychotic bloodlust loomed as the only viable option against this formidable foe. A strategic decision weighed heavily on his mind. He would wait until every last one of his animals succumbed to the Namu's might, placing them elsewhere for now seemed challenging. And so the battle of attrition persisted. The Namu stood tall amidst the lifeless bodies of the animal force, a grim testament to the relentless power it possessed. Shigaraki, convinced of his apparent victory, found solace in his deranged laughter as the USJ became a battlefield soaked in the blood of both hero and beast. Izuku surveyed the aftermath with a heavy sigh, acknowledging the inevitability of resorting to psychotic bloodlust. The plaza was now stained with the remnants of the fallen animals and the relentless Namu. A sense of determination flickered in his eyes. Oh well, he thought, embracing the grim reality of what lay ahead, a killing spree. Meanwhile, a group of villains, having successfully concealed themselves during the chaotic onslaught, cautiously emerged from their hiding places, observing the Namu standing amidst the battlefield. They erupted into cheers, their twisted admiration for the creature fueled by the carnage that had unfolded. Their triumphant celebration echoed through the devastated USJ. At the main entrance, the students had regrouped, their eyes fixed on the gruesome scene in the plaza. Gyro's quiet reflection revealed gratitude toward the wolves that had saved them earlier. One of those wolves really saved our asses back at those mountains didn't even get to thank it, she muttered, her voice carrying a mix of awe and regret. Shizaki, a student from Class 1B, took a different approach. Deep in prayer, she sought forgiveness for both the fallen animals and villains, a silent plea to a higher power to absolve the sins of both parties involved. As the prayers escaped her lips, the crimson hue of the flooded zone served as a somber backdrop, a reminder of the bloodshed that had occurred. Asui and Minda sat in stunned silence, processing the gruesome spectacle before them. Asui clutched an asp in her hands, trembling slightly, while Minda's gaze remained fixed on the ground. Back Hugo, typically unyielding in his demeanor, couldn't help but sneer at the sight. However, Kirishima, ever the empathetic friend, pointed toward the flooded zone, its crimson red waters visible from their vantage point. They saw it all happen apparently, Kirishima explained, his tone carrying a sense of understanding. The gruesome tableau had left an indelible mark on those who bore witness. Even Bakugo, in a rare moment of self-reflection, felt a twinge of shame and guilt for his earlier callous remarks. The weight of the events unfolding around them pressed heavily on the hearts of the students, a stark reminder of the harsh realities of heroism. Izuku's actions reverberated with a chilling intensity as he discarded his helmet and shattered his mask, revealing a darkness that lurked within him. With a deep introspection, he tapped into the depths of his being until he found what he sought. 
As he opened his eyes, a sinister transformation took place. The once clear whites turned abyssal black, and a twisted smile crept across his face. With the activation of psychotic bloodlust, the constraints that bound his abilities shatter, the limits imposed on his animal summoner and arsenal powers dissolved into oblivion, no longer constrained by extinction or the confines of legend. Izuku's capabilities surged to unprecedented heights. A single marble materialized in his hand, a harbinger of impending chaos. With a flick of his wrist, he launched it into the air, setting a chain of events into motion that would forever alter the course of the battle. Meanwhile, at the main entrance of the USJ, the atmosphere crackled with tension as All Might, in his formidable buff form, made a resolute entrance. His usual grin was replaced by a stern scowl as his gaze fell upon the scene unfolding in the main plaza. The magnitude of the carnage before him struck him to the core, freezing him in place as his eyes widened with each passing moment. The UA staff, trailing behind him, fell silent in stunned disbelief, their expressions mirroring the shock and awe that gripped them. Back at the plaza, the surviving villains recoiled in fear, their bravado crumbling in the face of an unseen terror. Even Shigaraki, the orchestrator of chaos, bore a flicker of apprehension in his eyes, while Kirajiri trembled with uncertainty. And then, breaking through the eerie silence, the ancient roar of an Allosaurus echoed through the air, its primal call signaling the dawn of an unimaginable reckoning that would reverberate throughout Musutafu and beyond. Shigaraki's trembling voice broke the tension, and in Namu, kill it. The Namu, in a rapid blink, lunged at the newfound threat. However, a shield materialized before it, halting its advance. Bohoho nana no no. My friend here is only for the other ones. I'm the one you'll be facing, a cold and dark voice announced. A green-haired teen, clad in military armor, emerged as the wielder of both the shield and a sense of ominous authority. The Namu, determined to obliterate its opponent, shattered the shield with brute force. But in response, a swift slice from the green-haired teen severed the Namu's arm. A subsequent kick to the head made the Namu stumble away. Furui, go deal with the small fry, will you? The teen commanded, obeying without hesitation. The Allosaurus, named Furui, dashed towards the remaining villains, leaving the primary confrontation to unfold. The Namu's armor grew, showcasing its impressive regenerative capabilities. Ah, regeneration. And a bit of shock absorption, it seems. I wonder who made you. The teen's voice, dripping with curiosity, echoed through the battleground. In an instant, Izuku appeared behind the Namu, his falchion and machete stained with purple blood as the hands of the Namu were sliced to bits. Meanwhile, back at the main entrance, Minda was gasping for breath. He can do that he can do that. Tears streamed down his face as he rocked back and forth. Hound Dog, taking on the role of a counselor, noticed Minda's distress and swiftly approached him, enveloping the small boy in a comforting hug. In a hushed tone, he asked, who can do what? Minda, caught in the throes of panic, mumbled incomprehensibly. However, Asui, gripping the APS rifle like a lifeline, stepped forward and provided the answer, Midori. Izuku continued to soar through the sky above the Namu, which was now enduring a relentless assault. In his hand, three marbles gleamed ominously. With a triumphant grin, he declared, Here, I got some more friends for you. As the marbles shattered, three dire wolves materialized, showcasing that psychotic bloodlust had a similar effect on his summoned creatures. The Namu, already battered and bruised, faced an onslaught from the newly arrived dire wolves. One of them lunged forward and ripped the regenerated hand from the Namu while another targeted the calf, tearing into it with ferocity. The third dire wolf set its sights on the beak, biting it off with a vicious snap. The Namu, now overwhelmed by both Izuku and the relentless assault of his predatory allies, struggled to withstand the combined force of man and beast. As the Namu's parts began to regenerate, it seized one of the dire wolves, crushing it with a powerful grip. However, Izuku swiftly changed tactics. In a flash, he transitioned from soaring through the sky to appearing behind the Namu. With a decisive strike, the Namu's head was severed from its body, sent flying into the air where it shattered into a million fragments. Silence enveloped the plaza as Izuku stood amidst the aftermath of the battle. The only sounds that punctuated the quiet were the heavy thud of the now lifeless Namu hitting the ground and the gruesome tearing of flesh as the villain called Minotaurus was swallowed whole by the Allosaurus. The scene painted a stark picture of the brutal conflict that had unfolded, leaving no doubt about the ferocity of the clash between hero and villain. With the Namu defeated, Izuku turned his attention to the remaining villains across from him, a confident smile playing on his lips. Furui, you've done enough, why don't you go visit the mind world, eh? Furui, responding to Izuku's command, disappeared, leaving the plaza. Izuku then flipped the death switch on the remaining dire wolves. So, I find it very funny that all it took were some predators of mother nature to turn your league into nothing but fleshy remains. Izuku's taunting words hung in the air, and Shigaraki, fueled by rage, charged at him. However, before either of them could make a move, Lavrenti Kapanans fired his 20mm caliber rifle. The powerful round tore Shigaraki's outstretched right hand to shreds, 
and he cried out in pain, falling to his knees. Izuku, now standing over the wounded villain, casually placed the machete against Shigaraki's throat. The moment seemed ripe for a finishing blow. But before Izuku could execute the attack, Kurajiri swiftly warped both himself and Shigaraki out of the building. Izuku clicked his tongue in mild frustration. As his eyes returned to their normal state, exhaustion took over, and he collapsed, falling unconscious. The chaotic battle at the USJ had come to an unexpected and tumultuous end. Izuku slowly blinked his eyes open, the harsh glare of the white ceiling causing a sharp pang of discomfort. As awareness gradually returned, he became acutely aware of the restrictive cuff encircling his wrist, suppressing his abilities. His mind raced to piece together the events that had led to his current predicament. With a low groan, Izuku muttered to himself, what in the flying fuck happened? His gaze drifted to the phone that materialized in his hand, a solitary contact displayed on the screen, Gaima. With a mixture of apprehension and resignation, he initiated the call, his voice tinged with uncertainty as he spoke. Gaima, he greeted, his tone carrying a hint of resignation. The response came swiftly, Gaimai's voice calm and collected despite the gravity of the situation. Ah, Izuku, how's it going? He inquired, a subtle undercurrent of amusement in his voice. Izuku couldn't help but feel a twinge of annoyance at Gaimai's nonchalant demeanor. Well, not good apparently, he replied dryly, his frustration evident. Got cuffed to a bed. Gaimai's response was laced with a hint of amusement. Yeah, no wonder, he remarked, his tone betraying a sense of amusement. Got reports from the Cerberus operatives. You really turned the USJ into a slaughterhouse, eh? Izuku's expression remained impassive as he absorbed Gaimai's words. The memory of the chaotic battle at the USJ flooded back, the echoes of screams and the clash of steel reverberating in his mind. Despite his efforts to control the situation, the outcome had been nothing short of devastating. But I did, Izuku conceded, his voice tinged with resignation. So, what do I do now? Gaimai's chuckle resonated through the phone, a sound both reassuring and ominous. Well, they'll probably bring you to a prison or something, he mused, his tone casual despite the gravity of the situation. Not that they'll get far. Izuku's brow furrowed in confusion at Gaimai's cryptic remark. The implication hung heavy in the air, hinting at a deeper layer of complexity to the situation. As he pondered Gaimai's words, a sense of unease settled over him, the uncertainty of what lay ahead gnawing at his resolve. Any suggestions? Izuku ventured, his voice betraying a hint of apprehension. Gaimai's response was swift and decisive. Stay calm, for starters, he advised, his tone reassuring yet cryptic. Keep your wits about you and trust in your instincts, we'll figure out the next steps together. Izuku nodded, his mind racing with a myriad of questions and uncertainties. The prospect of facing the repercussions of his actions weighed heavily on him, yet a flicker of determination burned within him. He refused to be defined by the mistakes of the past, resolved to confront whatever challenges lay ahead with courage and resilience. As the conversation drew to a close, Izuku couldn't shake the lingering sense of apprehension that lingered in the air. The road ahead was fraught with uncertainty, the path forward shrouded in shadows. Yet, amidst the darkness, a glimmer of hope beckoned, a beacon of light to guide him through the storm. With a steady resolve, Izuku braced himself for the trials that awaited him, determined to face whatever challenges lay ahead with unwavering resolve. The journey ahead would be fraught with danger and uncertainty, but he refused to falter in the face of adversity. As he ended the call, Izuku's thoughts turned inward, a sense of determination coursing through his veins. Whatever trials awaited him, he would face them head-on, armed with courage, resilience, and the unwavering resolve to emerge victorious against all odds. In the heart of Kubo's scrapyard, Gaimai sat amidst the remnants of discarded machinery and forgotten relics. His surroundings, a testament to the passage of time and the cyclical nature of destruction and creation, seemed to mirror the chaos that loomed on the horizon. In his hands, he gripped an FNEVOLYS, a formidable weapon ready to be unleashed. A sudden materialization caught his attention. An old Nokia phone appeared in his hand, a relic from a bygone era. Gaimai's piercing gaze focused on the device as he dialed a number known only to a select few. The connection established. A voice on the other end inquired, Who is this? With an air of authority, Gaimai responded, Order 3, prepare mass deployment. The cryptic exchange held a weight of significance, signaling the initiation of a plan set in motion. The caller on the other end received the terse command, a directive that would set the stage for the unfolding events. As the words hung in the air, Gaimai brought the conversation to an abrupt end, crushing the phone in his grip, severing the connection. Stepping out onto the desolate streets of Kubo Scrapyard, Gaimai's demeanor exuded a sense of calculated purpose. In his hand, a white marble materialized, its seemingly innocuous appearance belying the destructive force it harbored. With a swift, practiced motion, he hurled the marble towards a random building, the impact causing it to crack. As the fissures spread, a surge of energy erupted from the shattered structure, the unleashed power of a Cooper bomb. 
The building, once a silent sentinel in the urban landscape, succumbed to the devastating force. The echoes of the explosion reverberated through the streets, signaling the commencement of a chain reaction that would ripple through the city. In the wake of the destructive display, the first casualties of the upcoming war were claimed. The building crumbled, its remnants scattered like ash in the wind. The act, a calculated strike, served as both a declaration and a warning, a harbinger of the chaos and upheaval that would soon grip the city. As Gaimai observed the aftermath, the air thick with the acrid scent of destruction, a subtle smile played on his lips. The golden eagle had awakened, its wings poised to cast a shadow over the unfolding events. The stage was set, and the pieces were in motion. Each move a calculated step towards an inevitable clash. The city, unaware of the impending storm, continued its rhythmic pulse, oblivious to the machinations that unfolded in the shadows. Gaimai, the orchestrator of chaos, stood amidst the wreckage, a silent harbinger of the tumultuous events that would soon reshape the landscape. The war had begun, and the city would bear witness to the unfolding drama, the first act of a larger narrative yet to be unveiled. Slugger sprinted toward the reported crime scene, driven by the urgency of a villain attack. His determined strides carried him closer to the source of the explosion, the chaotic aftermath looming on the horizon. As he approached, a sudden movement caught him off guard, a ripple in the otherwise tense atmosphere. A voice, cold and taunting, reached Slugger's ears. Well, well, welcome. You're the first hero here. Not that it'll matter now, then. I have some conditions. The ominous statement hung in the air, leaving Slugger to question the nature of the impending confrontation. Undeterred, he responded with a resolute, And why would I care? The air was filled with sinister laughter, a haunting soundtrack to the unfolding drama. As the smoke from the explosion began to clear, Slugger's eyes widened, revealing a scene that froze his movement. Before him stood a man, a chilling figure, holding a child in his hands. A knife pressed against her throat, a cruel instrument of control. The gravity of the situation became palpable as Slugger, now confronted with a life-or-death scenario, struggled to comprehend the unfolding tragedy. His instincts screamed at him urging him to act, but the mysterious assailant seemed to revel in the power he held. The child, a helpless hostage, became a pawn in a twisted game. In a moment that seemed to stretch into eternity, the man's voice sliced through the tension. Well, since you don't care, she's no use to me. The declaration hung in the air, a grim prelude to the impending horror. With a swift, merciless motion, the knife slashed across the child's throat, a brutal act that stained the scene with a stark reality. The abruptness of the violence left Slugger momentarily paralyzed, the weight of the situation sinking in. The child, once an innocent victim, now lay in the clutches of death, the crimson stain of tragedy unfolding before Slugger's eyes. The echoes of the villain's laughter resonated, a cruel soundtrack to the aftermath of a crime that defied reason. As Slugger grappled with the shock and horror of the scene, the villain's cold gaze met his. The conditions laid out before were now rendered irrelevant as the irreversible consequences of the villain's actions cast a shadow over the hero's resolve. The first responder had arrived, but the cost had been a life, a stark reminder of the unforgiving nature of heroism in the face of malevolence. Slugger, his voice strained with a mix of grief and anger, managed to utter, You why would you the villain, seemingly indifferent to the weight of his actions, chuckled in response. Once a leader of a huge country had a quote, A single death is a tragedy, a million deaths are a statistic. Joseph Stalin, familiar to you. Oh well, let's get going, shall we? Before Slugger could fully grasp the situation, the villain was suddenly in front of him. The speed and precision of the movement left Slugger in a vulnerable position. Without warning, the villain's fist lunged through Slugger's chest, tearing through ribs and lung and exiting through the back. The brutality of the attack shocked Slugger, and he could feel the life draining from him. Oh my, the villain remarked casually. Bet you're regretting not caring, eh? The words hung in the air, a cruel taunt as Slugger grappled with the agonizing consequences of his inaction. The irony of the villain's reference to Stalin's quote underscored the callousness with which he treated life, reducing it to a mere statistic in the pursuit of his twisted objectives. Slugger, now on the verge of collapse, struggled to comprehend the senseless brutality he had witnessed, the child's death, the callousness of the villain, and now his own impending demise painted a harrowing picture of the consequences of apathy in the face of evil. The realization struck Slugger with a bitter intensity, as the world around him dimmed, and the echoes of the villain's laughter became the last sounds he heard before succumbing to the abyss. Gaimai gazed at the lifeless hero sprawled before him. With a casual flick of his wrist, the restraints on his hand dissipated, freeing him from any lingering constraints. He nonchalantly kicked the fallen hero's corpse to the ground, a callous gesture that mirrored his disregard for life. Well, time to go a bit more extreme, eh? Gaimai mused to himself, his eyes scanning the surroundings. His gaze fixated on a nearby establishment, Nico's Coffee Cafe. It seemed like the chosen target for his escalating violence. Another white marble materialized in his hand, 
and a sinister smile crept across his face. With purposeful intent, he hurled the marble toward the cafe. As the marble soared through the air, it found its mark, crashing through a window and shattering upon impact. However, this time, it carried a far more destructive force, the power of a general-purpose bomb. The resulting explosion engulfed Nico's coffee cafe in a blaze of devastation, the flames licking at the structure as debris scattered in all directions. Gaimai, unfazed by the chaos he had unleashed, observed the fiery aftermath with an eerie calm. The once cozy cafe now stood as a smoldering ruin, a testament to the unbridled violence he was willing to unleash. The escalating scale of his actions hinted at a growing malevolence, a force that seemed determined to leave a trail of destruction in its wake. The question lingered. What dark purpose drove Gaimai to such extremes, and what horrors awaited those who stood in his path? Gaimai, undeterred by the lack of response to his previous acts of violence, felt a sinister satisfaction brewing within him. Still no response. Well, more death it is, he muttered to himself with an unsettling calmness. In his hand, a new creation took shape, a white ball resembling a bowling ball, but harboring a far more malevolent purpose. With a swift and deliberate motion, Gaimai hurled the white ball toward a bustling street. As it made contact with the ground, it revealed its true nature, transforming into a cluster bomb. The bowling ball-like object unleashed its deadly payload, scattering a dozen smaller marbles in every direction. The ensuing chaos was swift and merciless. The smaller marbles, like harbingers of doom, careened through the air, finding their unsuspecting victims amid the crowded street. Each marble carried a destructive force of its own, wreaking havoc and sowing panic among the unfortunate souls caught in the crossfire. Screams echoed through the air as the chaotic scene unfolded. The once vibrant street became a theater of tragedy, with people fleeing in terror, seeking refuge from the indiscriminate violence unleashed by Gaimai's calculated malevolence. The aftermath left a haunting tableau of destruction, a stark reminder of the darkness that lurked within Gaimai's action. As the echoes of the chaos subsided, Gaimai's inscrutable motives remained shrouded in mystery. What compelled him to unleash such brutality, and what sinister purpose lay behind these escalating acts of violence? The unanswered questions only deepened the sense of dread surrounding Gaimai, leaving a city on edge, haunted by the unpredictable horrors that seemed to follow in his wake. Momoko Ito, known by her hero alias Simmer, was part of the Fire Squad, a lesser-known hero team based in Musutafu. Led by Sparks, the team also comprised Blaze and Ignition, each with their own unique abilities. Despite their local fan base, they were ready to face any threat that came their way. Responding to a villain attack, the Fire Squad hurried to the scene under Sparks' leadership. As they approached the site of destruction, Sparks urged caution. Be on guard, he warned, emphasizing the need for vigilance in the face of danger. Standing amidst the chaos, Simmer couldn't shake off a sense of unease. She voiced her concerns to Sparks, questioning whether the reported D-rank villain threat matched the scale of destruction before them. However, Sparks remained resolute, relying on Slugger's assessment of the situation. With determination, Sparks rallied the fire squad to action. Fire squad attack. He commanded, leading the charge alongside Blaze and Ignition. Simmer hesitated, her instincts warning her of impending danger. Something fell off, out of place, amidst the chaos unfolding before them. Despite her doubts, Simmer knew that she couldn't afford to ignore her team's call to action. With a deep breath, she steeled herself for the battle ahead, ready to confront whatever sinister force lurked behind the facade of the D-rank villain threat. As the fire squad plunged into the heart of the conflict, Simmer remained vigilant, her senses sharp and her determination unwavering in the face of uncertainty. Gaimai, the general director, cracked his neck with a sense of amusement. He found the heroes to be quite underwhelming, given the scale of destruction he had unleashed. Adorned in his distinctive uniform, Gaimai wore a black trench coat, pants, combat boots, gloves, and an officer's cap. His appearance exuded a sense of authority and menace, amplified by the Nimcha sword in his hand and a machine gun casually slung over his shoulder. As the heroes of the fire squad approached, Gaimai chuckled, realizing that he might have to take matters into his own hands. He had just decimated an entire street of civilians, and only four heroes showed up to confront him. The odds seemed laughably in his favor. Gaimai heard approaching footsteps and swiftly dodged a fireball aimed at his face. Although the attack caused a bit of his tar-like skin to melt, it quickly regenerated. Intrigued by the prospect of a real challenge, he addressed the four heroes before him. Ah, finally some action. So, you four are. Gaimai inquired, his tone laced with mocking curiosity. Sparks, the leader of the fire squad, stepped forward and confidently declared, We are the fire squad, villain, and will be your doom. Gaimai hummed, seemingly unimpressed. Never heard of them, but go ahead. Without hesitation, Ignition, also known as Katashi Shuratori, lunged forward with his fist engulfed in fire. However, he missed his punch, and Gaimai responded with a swift kick to his gut. The hero staggered backward, momentarily caught off guard by the unexpected agility and skill of the seemingly formidable villain. 
Kai Mai grinned, relishing the thrill of the confrontation. Is that the best you've got? This might be more entertaining than I thought. As the fire squad prepared for a battle that seemed increasingly one-sided, Gaimai's confidence and sadistic enjoyment of the chaos continued to escalate. The clash between heroes and villain was set, and the outcome remained uncertain in the midst of the chaos that unfolded. Blaze, the fiery member of the fire squad, launched beams of fire towards the villain with determination. However, Gaimai's agility proved to be too much, as he effortlessly dodged the incoming attacks. Ignition, undeterred by his previous failure, attempted another punch, but once again, the villain anticipated his move and swiftly avoided it. As the chaotic battle unfolded before her, Simmer, the support role of the fire squad, could only watch with a growing sense of unease. Her attention was drawn away from the fight, her eyes fixated on the lifeless body of Slugger, one of their own fallen comrades, lying amidst the destruction. The sight of Slugger's body amidst the devastation struck a chord of grief and anger within Simmer. Her heart pounded with a mixture of sorrow and determination as she realized the true cost of the battle they were facing. Despite her role as a support member, she felt a surge of resolve to avenge Slugger's death and put an end to the villain's rampage. Simmer's gaze shifted back to the ongoing fight. Her mind focused on finding a way to turn the tide against the formidable foe they faced. With Slugger's sacrifice weighing heavily on her mind, she knew that they couldn't afford to fail. As the fire squad continued to battle against the odds, Simmer silently vowed to honor Slugger's memory by fighting with all her strength until justice prevailed. Gaimai, feeling increasingly bored with the ongoing battle, found himself reminiscing about past encounters and more thrilling challenges, such as the confrontations with the Takuchi clan in the Night District. Despite their outdated weaponry, those battles had provided a certain level of excitement that seemed lacking in the current situation. As he effortlessly dodged yet another attack from Ignition, Gaimai couldn't help but reflect on the contrast between the current engagement and his past experiences. He found himself yearning for the adrenaline rush of those intense battles against formidable adversaries. However, his boredom was soon interrupted by the sound of a feminine voice calling out to Ignition. Gaimai glanced around and noticed that the area was surrounded by police forces, with civilians gathered nearby watching the spectacle unfold. He found it curious that they hadn't been evacuated considering standard emergency procedures dictated the removal of civilians from potentially dangerous situations. A sly smile crept across Gaimai's face as he realized the opportunity that lay before him. Seizing the moment, he extended his left hand, palm outstretched, and uttered a single word, shine. With that command, a dark flame erupted from his palm, swirling into a raging inferno that engulfed the unsuspecting civilians and police officers. The sudden eruption of black flames sent shockwaves through the crowd as panic and chaos ensued. Gaimai observed the chaos with a sense of satisfaction, relishing the havoc he had unleashed upon the unsuspecting populace. To him, it was a reminder of his power and the fear he instilled in those who dared to oppose him. As the flames continued to consume everything in their path, Gaimai's grin widened, reveling in the chaos and destruction he had wrought. For him, it was just another demonstration of his dominance and the lengths he was willing to go to assert his authority. Blaze's eyes widened in horror as he witnessed the unthinkable. The villain had turned his attention to the innocent civilians, unleashing black flames upon them without remorse. The realization struck Blaze like a punch to the gut, and anger surged within him. What's wrong? Gaimai taunted, locking eyes with Blaze. You know it's their own fault. They shouldn't be so close to a fight of life and death. But they played and were rewarded with death. Blaze's scowl deepened, his anger simmering beneath the surface. They had nothing to do with this. The villain chuckled callously. Oh really? Well, next time, get them out of here. Without further hesitation, Gaimai launched another attack. In the blink of an eye, he appeared behind Blaze, and with a speed that defied comprehension, the Nimsha sword manifested its deadly power. A sideways gash sliced through Blaze's body, and his lifeblood spurted everywhere. Blaze fell to his knees, a pained expression on his face, before finally collapsing onto the ground with a heavy thud. The brutal display left an indelible mark on the hero team, and the weight of the villain's merciless actions lingered in the air. Gaimai, reveling in the chaos he had sown, continued to taunt and strike fear into the hearts of those who dared to oppose him. As the sirens echoed across vast expanses of land, from Siberia to Korea, China, Mongolia, Russia, Belarus, Poland, Finland, the Caucasus, Baltic, and Kaliningrad, the ominous resonance signaled the activation of Order 3. The National Crisis Committee, along with its allies and puppet states, had initiated a mass deployment that rippled through military bases like a foreboding drumbeat. In army bases, soldiers mobilized swiftly, boarding trucks that would transport them to the strategic ports of Siberia, Korea, and China. Air bases buzzed with activity as pilots climbed into an array of planes, preparing for deployment. In Kurilsk, a squadron from Wing Pitter, designated AZ-9, geared up for a bombing raid on Rasu. 
Ten Blackburn Rocks and eight Bristol Blenheims roared to life, engines humming with lethal intent. Naval bases became hubs of movement, with both transport ships and naval vessels readying for deployment. Deep in the Ural Mountains, the labs of the National Crisis Committee Science Corp hummed with activity, churning out hundreds of clones in preparation for the impending war. Vladivostok emerged as a focal point, where soldiers from nearby army bases like Fort Pestgeny, Tefriz, Balsjaj came in, and others embarked on transport ships. Alongside them, formidable battlecruisers joined the convoy, marking a formidable force gathering in the shadows. Unbeknownst to the world, a clandestine protocol had been activated, Protocol Eagle's Revenge. Japan, unsuspecting and unprepared, would become the first casualty in this unfolding global conflict. The wheels of war had been set in motion and the world teetered on the brink of an unprecedented and unforeseen cataclysm. Izuku Midoriya found himself back in the hospital, still processing the recent events that had transpired. Dressed in his USJ attire, remnants of the chaotic incident still lingered in his thoughts. Kaimai's surge in power, felt the moment their call ended, left an intriguing impression on him. As he waited, a trio entered the room. Sukachi Neyamasa, a detective from the police force, led the group. Nezu, perched on the shoulder of one of the men, offered an element of familiarity. The third member, Officer Tamakawa, displayed an unusual characteristic with the head of a cat. Midoriya Izuku, Tsukachi began, his tone both authoritative and inquisitive. I am Tsukachi Neyamasa, a detective. Next to me is Officer Tamakawa. Nezu observed the proceedings from his perch. Tsukachi continued, I will be asking some questions about the events of the USJ. Do you consent? Also, if you do, I must inform you that my quirk can detect lies. Izuku nodded, his gaze steady. I consent. Ask your questions. Sukachi leaned in, a serious expression on his face. What exactly happened at the USJ? Provide a detailed account of the events as you experienced them. Izuku recounted the chaos that unfolded during the USJ incident, describing the villain's intrusion, the ensuing battles, and the aftermath. He spared no detail, offering a transparent narrative of his actions and observations. The detective listened attentively, occasionally exchanging glances with Officer Tamakawa. Nezu, the small yet astute principal, observed the proceedings with keen interest. Once Izuku finished his account, Tsukachi nodded thoughtfully. Your cooperation is appreciated. One last question. Do you have any knowledge of the identity or motives of the villains involved in the USJ attack? Izuku furrowed his brow, deep in thought. No, I'm afraid I don't. They were masked, and their motives remained unclear to me. My focus was on ensuring the safety of myself and my classmates. Tsukachi, satisfied with Izuku's responses, thanked him for his cooperation. If you remember anything or if there's any development, please don't hesitate to inform us. As the detective and officer left the room, Nezu lingered for a moment. Interesting times we live in, Midoriya. Keep your wits about you. Izuku, left to contemplate the interrogation, knew that the shadows of uncertainty and intrigue loomed over his experiences, and he could only brace himself for what lay ahead. Izuku's heart raced as he maneuvered through the hospital corridors, his movements calculated and precise. The weight of the pistol in his hand served as a reminder of the dangers that lurked in the shadows. Encountering an unfamiliar officer guarding the room, Izuku acted swiftly, his training kicking in. With a silent approach, he subdued the officer, his hand muffling any cries for help. The muted sound of the gunshot echoed through the room as Izuku efficiently neutralized the threat, moving with the grace of a shadow. Izuku navigated the hospital's labyrinthine hallways until he reached the downstairs parking lot. There, amidst the rows of vehicles, stood the familiar silhouette of the ink-black Monterey Mercury, patiently waiting like a loyal sentinel. Without a word, Izuku slipped into the passenger seat, the tension in the air palpable. Across from him, Gaimai sat at the wheel, his presence a silent acknowledgement of the precarious situation they found themselves in. As the car pulled away from the hospital, the night enveloped them like a cloak of secrecy. In the darkness, Izuku knew that their journey was far from over and the road ahead promised more challenges, more mysteries waiting to be unraveled. With Gaimai by his side, he braced himself for the unknown, ready to confront whatever fate had in store. Officer Junko Aidu's heart pounded as she stared in horror at the devastation that engulfed the once bustling city of Rasu. The sunlit morning had quickly turned into a nightmare, with the tranquility shattered by the piercing wail of air raid sirens, a relic of a bygone era suddenly resurrected. Sitting beside her, Officer Shijimaki, her seasoned partner, gripped the radio with urgency, seeking answers in the chaos that unfolded around them. His voice crackled through the static, a lifeline in the tumultuous storm of confusion and fear. The response from Officer Matsuda, a fellow officer, was a chilling confirmation of their worst fears. The ominous presence of planes overhead heralded a relentless onslaught, a merciless barrage raining down upon the unsuspecting city. In a heartbeat, the peaceful coffee shop where they sought solace became a battleground. 
the tranquility shattered by the deafening roar of explosions and the shrill cries of destruction. Blockbuster bombs and incendiary rounds descended upon the hapless civilians, transforming the once familiar streets into a landscape of ruin and despair. For Officer Idu and Officer Mackie, there was no time to dwell on the shock and horror that gripped their hearts. Amidst the chaos, they knew their duty remained clear, to stand firm in the face of adversity, to protect and serve, even as the world crumbled around them. As the echoes of devastation reverberated through the shattered cityscape, Officer Idu braced herself for the trials ahead, her resolve unwavering in the crucible of tragedy. In the darkest hour, amidst the ruins of Rasu, the spirit of resilience burned brightly, a beacon of hope in the shadow of despair. Squadron AZ-9 soared through the skies over Mount Rasu, the jagged peaks below reminiscent of the familiar Hiblian mountains that held memories of senior airman Sergio D'Onofrio's hometown in Sicily. As a machine gunner stationed in the dorsal gun turret of the Bristol Blenheim bombers, Sergio's gaze lingered on the mountainous terrain. The pilot of the plane, Benjamin Laska, hailed from Prasov, Slovakia. Like Sergio, he was among the many who sought refuge in the territories controlled by the National Crisis Committee. Europe had been ravaged by ceaseless civil wars, prompting people to seek safety and stability in the NCC's domain. The once divided nations had found unity under the NCC's influence, providing a sanctuary for those displaced by the conflict. Sergio's journey to the NCC-controlled territory was driven by the turmoil in Sicily, where the region was split into three factions engaged in constant warfare. Rather than becoming entangled in the strife among his fellow Italians, he chose the path of migration to Poland, an NCC ally. Over the years, Sergio had risen through the ranks to become a senior airman, reflecting his dedication and skill. As Squadron AZ-9 cruised through the airspace, the multicultural composition of the team symbolized the convergence of diverse backgrounds under the banner of the NCC. Together, they navigated the skies with a shared purpose, united by the refuge and opportunities their adopted home had provided. In the cockpit, Benjamin Laska maintained focus, steering the aircraft through the airspace with precision. The Hablian-like mountains below stood as a testament to the geographical diversity within the NCC-controlled territory a landscape that mirrored the resilience of its people in the face of adversity. As the squadron continued its flight over Mount Rasu, the crew members embodied the collective strength forged from their varied origins. In the skies above, they carried not only the weight of their personal histories, but also the shared responsibility of safeguarding the NCC's vision of stability in an ever-changing world. Hideyoshi Yoshino, also known as Electro Rock, sat at his desk in his vibrant agency atop Mount Rasu. The building, with its electric and watery theme, housed his hero operations. Hideyoshi's quirk, wet volt, allowed him to generate electric water from his palms, nose, ears, and mouth. Leading a team of psychics and two third-year interns from Asakawa Hero University, Electro Rock's group worked diligently to maintain the safety of Rasu and occasionally Shibsu. His psychic team consisted of Aquashock, Dripper, Weller, Hydro Hose, and Charge Up. The third-year interns, Voltage and Volt Tide, provided additional support and learning opportunities for the aspiring heroes. Together, they formed a formidable team capable of handling various threats. As Electro Rock wrapped up paperwork for a merch deal, Aiko Takuchi, also known as Weller, burst into the room in a state of distress. Normally on relief duty due to personal matters, Weller appeared agitated and exhausted. Between deep breaths, she conveyed urgent information about a villain attack in Rasu, signaling in a rank threat with involvement of planes. Before she could elaborate further, exhaustion overcame her, and she fell unconscious. The alarm blared, indicating a serious situation unfolding in Rasu. Electro Rock and his team sprang into action, ready to face the imminent danger. The news of an rank villain attack involving planes heightened the urgency of their response. Meanwhile, in the skies above Mount Rasu, Lt. Col. Torbjorn Algren led Squadron AZ-9, escorting the bombers towards their target. The squadron leader's voice crackled over the radio, directing the fighters to clear the way for the bombers. Benjamin Laska, piloting one of the Bristol Blenheim bombers, received the signal to release the payload. With a click of a button, Benjamin unleashed the payload on the designated target, a distinctive yellow-blue building. The mission was underway, and the heroes on the ground, including Electro Rock and his team, faced the challenge of confronting the rank villain threat head-on. Ken Hashimoto also known as Charge Up, rushed outside the building where he was stationed. The chilling breeze atop Mount Rasu carried a foreboding sense of danger. As he looked skyward, he identified 18 planes, a menacing formation of 10 smaller ones and 8 larger ones. In a sudden and horrifying turn of events, one of the larger planes released a bombing run on the Electro Rock Agency. Reacting swiftly, Ken gritted his teeth and cursed under his breath. He glanced behind him at the now devastated building. The once seven-floor structure had been reduced to five, with the seventh floor obliterated and the sixth reduced to rubble. The gravity of the situation hit him, and he knew immediate action was required. 
activating his quirk. Storm control can manipulate the weather, causing rain to pour and thunder to roar in the surrounding area. Meanwhile, in one of the Blackburn Rock's dorsal turrets, a clone identified as A1-1007 sat, part of the first generation of clones under Project Ural by the National Crisis Committee Science Corp. This clone, devoid of real emotions, fulfilled its duty with utmost precision. The pilot, A1-1409, shared the same clone origin. The generations of clones improved with each iteration, creating a force that required no sleep, food, or other human necessities. Regardless of the generation, when given a mission, they executed it diligently and to the fullest extent of their capabilities. Charge up, determined to retaliate, closed his eyes and channeled his powers to target one of the enemy planes with a lightning strike. The crackling bolt hit one of the smaller planes, severing its right wing and sending it hurtling down to the ground. In the Blackburn Rock, A1-1409 observed the loss of the right wing and calmly transmitted a report. Plane NC 7,888,903 Canadian dollars OI going down. One of the enemies can control weather. Suggest retreat. A1-1007, in the same aircraft's dorsal turret, comprehended the situation, focused on the people below, some of whom were heroes from the targeted building. It unleashed rounds from the M1919 Browning machine guns with precise accuracy. With unwavering determination, A1-1409 steered the Blackburn Rock directly into the Electro Rock Agency. The impact unleashed a burning inferno. And in that moment, both clones met their end, soaring no more through the skies. Torbjorn Algren surveyed the skies from his cockpit, witnessing the loss of one of his planes. He acknowledged, through the transmitted report, that it was a first-generation clone plane. Most of his squadron consisted of these clones, and despite their lack of emotions, they efficiently fulfilled their roles. Clones were now integral to the NCC's new approach to warfare, as Guy Microb's abilities allowed the creation of any weapon imaginable, and the NCC possessed an endless arsenal of advanced weaponry. The NCC had expanded its influence across China, Russia, Korea, Mongolia, and Europe, establishing dominance through a combination of strategic acquisitions and technological superiority. The new tactic involved deploying weaker weapons initially, gradually escalating to more advanced ones. This strategic approach forced the enemy to deplete their resources against the weaker weapons, only to face exponentially stronger ones later on. As another NCC plane went down, bearing the designation N-Cone 109,998 Canadian dollars a P and manned by clones 1A-2003 and 1A-1998, Algren expressed his frustration. All planes, pull up. They can't hit what they can't see. The order aimed to minimize the risk of the enemy hitting their aircraft, emphasizing the advantage of aerial maneuverability. Charge Up witnessed the aftermath of his retaliation against the enemy planes. Although he successfully hit two of them, the consequences were severe. One of the enemy planes, presumably manned by loyal or fearless individuals, crashed directly into the Electro Rock Agency. The impact caused the building to collapse, further worsening the destruction. The 7th, 6th, and 5th floors, already in disarray from previous bombings, now crumbled entirely. Despite the chaos, most of the agency's occupants managed to evacuate. The Electro Rock, displaying heroism, rescued an accountant and Weller, ensuring their safety. Unfortunately, others within the building succumbed to the bombings and the subsequent crash. Fujisawa Rikuto, a civilian employee, wielded a satellite phone, desperately attempting to contact the Hero Public Safety Commission. His aim was to provide information and alert them to the dire situation unfolding on Mount Rasu. The hope was that the HPSC could coordinate a response to the ongoing villain attack. The operator at HPSC Civil Service listened attentively to Fujisawa's urgent report. Hello, this is HPSC Civil Service. How can I help you? Fujisawa quickly relayed the distressing information, detailing the villain attack on Rasu and Mount Rasu, the unexpected use of planes, and the destruction of the Electro Rock Agency. He emphasized the casualties and injuries, concluding with a plea for reinforcements. The operator processed the information, her expression tense. There's been a bombing run on Rasu, and Hero Agency has been brought down, but the status on Rasa itself is unknown. They need assistance immediately. The operator reported urgently to her supervisor, a sense of desperation in her voice. The gravity of the situation prompted her to act swiftly to ensure a prompt and effective response. Torbjorn Algren, in his Blackburn Rock, transmitted orders to his squadron. We're going back to Kirilsk. All the bombers have let their payload loose. Turn back. The squadron swiftly executed a U-turn, their planes gracefully wheeling around as they departed from the Japanese mainland. The damage was done. A city lay in ruins, casualties left behind, and the NCC forces retreated, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. The echoes of the air raid sirens and the aftermath of the bombing run hung heavy over Rasu. 
In the center of Tokyo, a towering skyscraper with 73 floors served as the headquarters of the Hiro Public Safety Commission. The bustling metropolis below was a stark contrast to the summer atmosphere inside one of the dozen meeting rooms. Seated at the expansive table were key figures, including Miho Shimizu, renowned as Madam President and the head of the HPSC. Beside her sat Henry Nervwell, the chief of security, and to her right was Shohei Machizuki, the minister of defense. Around the table, high-ranking military personnel were present, including Nabu Tsukuda, chief of staff of the Japan Self-Defense Forces. Law enforcement was represented by Kenji Tsurigami the chief of police, while political leadership included the prime minister, Rokiro Higashi, and members of both the lower and upper houses. Nezu, the principal of UA, added an educational perspective. The meeting room also hosted some of the most prominent pro-heroes, featuring All Might, Endeavor, Hawks, Best Genist, and Yoroi Musha, among others. Notably absent was Miroku, one of the top ten heroes, who was occupied elsewhere. The atmosphere was tense, as the gathered individuals awaited Madam President's opening remarks. The events at Rasu and Mount Rasu had triggered this emergency meeting, and the ramifications of the unfamiliar attack were yet to be fully comprehended. The fate of Japan hung in the balance, and decisions made in this room would shape the nation's response to the unprecedented threat. Prime Minister Higashi's voice cut through the tense air of the meeting room, his tone cold and matter-of-fact. If I am correct, this attack has been classified as an A-rank incident, causing only minimal damage. So if I might ask, why was I summoned here? General Tsukuda, his expression a mix of frustration and disbelief, responded sharply, minimal damage. A whole city has been bombed to dust and ruins. You call that minimal damage? The Prime Minister's response was calculated, his demeanor unwavering. No, perhaps before the era of quirks, such an attack would have indeed been considered catastrophic. However, in today's context, yes, it is minimal. The only concerning aspect is the damage to a hero agency, and even that can be rectified without the need for my direct involvement, Chief Tsurigami. His voice laced with urgency and concern, interjected, With all due respect, sir, more than 3,000 lives have been lost, and 5,000 more have been displaced from their homes. The casualty count is alarmingly high. The Prime Minister acknowledged the Chief's words with a nod, his demeanor unyielding. I understand the gravity of the situation, Chief Tsurigami. However, it's important to note that more than 10,000 individuals lose their lives each month due to villainous activities across Japan. In the grand scheme of things, 3,000 casualties may pale in comparison. Moreover, the displacement caused by hero-villain clashes often results in prolonged homelessness. This attack, while tragic, is relatively minor compared to many others in Japan's history. He paused, his gaze sweeping across the room before continuing with conviction. As for the perpetrators, while their identities may currently elude us, it shouldn't be difficult to trace the origins of the planes used in the attack. The purchase of such aircraft will undoubtedly stand out, providing us with a clear lead in our investigation. The exchange highlighted the complex dynamics at play, where differing perspectives clashed amidst the backdrop of a nation grappling with the aftermath of a devastating assault. As discussions continued, the urgency of the situation underscored the need for swift and decisive action to ensure the safety and security of Japan and its people. Madam President Shimizu observed as Prime Minister Higashi announced his departure, a significant number of attendees from both houses following suit. Nervwell, the chief of security, remained composed, casually taking a sip of coffee before addressing the room with a calm demeanor. He'll be coming back soon, might take a few months, but, well, I guess it is to be expected, Nervwell remarked. The departure of the Prime Minister seemed to carry an air of inevitability. Now, while some people here might think similarly to Prime Minister Higashi, I'll say this once, it isn't because of the attack itself that you all have been summoned. No, it is because of a pattern. The room fell silent, the weight of Nervwell's words lingering in the air. Madam President Shimizu leaned forward, her gaze fixed on Nervwell as he continued, unfolding the layers of intrigue and concern that surrounded the unfolding situation. Nervwell's measured voice resonated in the tense silence of the room. You see, there were contacts in Europe who had gone silent some years ago. Initially, many of us attributed it to the rampant civil wars that had gripped the continent. However, recent developments suggest a more ominous reality. Upon revisiting the last transmission from an agent stationed in Le Mans, France, a few troubling reports surfaced. With a click of a button, a screen illuminated, displaying a comprehensive report with certain words strategically highlighted. Nervwell continued, guiding the attention of the room toward the unfolding revelations. Now, for those who might still be unclear, let me elaborate. France found itself embroiled in a five-sided civil war during the agent's last active years. The initial attacks involved biplanes, reminiscent of the World War I era. However, within three months, the conflict escalated to World War II-era bombings. Subsequently, it progressed through the Cold War and finally reached the modern era. 
The concluding lines of the report state, The skies are filled with Chengdu J-20 seconds, a 10 thunderbolts, and many more I do not recognize. Vessels, cluster bombs, anything that can explode, has been used. The city of St. Saturnin and its surroundings lie in ruins. Last I heard, tanks of all sizes have invaded Paris and nearby Orleans. I fear this is the last report I will send. Martin Perrault. The gravity of the situation hung heavily in the room. The shared silence amplifying the impact of the report. Nerval's revelation painted a grim picture, linking the European devastation to an ominous force that appeared to have now set its sights on Japan. As the attendees absorbed the shocking details, the realization dawned that the events unfolding in Japan might only be the beginning of a coordinated, global offensive. The strategic use of outdated and progressively modern weaponry in Europe foreshadowed a meticulous plan orchestrated by a force with formidable capabilities. In the wake of Martin Perrault's final words, the room grappled with the weight of the impending threat, recognizing the need for collective action and a unified response to safeguard their nation against an adversary whose motives and origins remained shrouded in mystery. Nerval's resonant voice filled the room once more, cutting through the heavy atmosphere. Now, it appears that it was World War II era planes that bombed the town, presenting us with two distinct possibilities, each one more dire than the other. The first scenario aligns with the Prime Minister's perspective, a small-scale attack orchestrated by villains who chose to unleash chaos upon the town for reasons yet unknown. Should this be the case, our immediate concern would be identifying the perpetrators responsible for this act. Pausing for emphasis, Nerval continued, his expression gravely serious. However, the second option, and in my opinion, the more ominous one, suggests that this was merely a preliminary move. They may not see the need to reveal the full extent of their plan just yet. And in a matter of months, genuine threats could be looming in the skies above us. The implications of Nerval's words hung in the air, heightening the tension in the room. The prospect of a delayed, more substantial assault hinted at a strategic patience on the part of the mysterious adversary. As the assembled figures contemplated the unfolding threat, a sense of urgency enveloped the room, pushing them to consider the implications and prepare for the looming storm on the horizon. All Might, his voice carrying the weight of years of heroism and wisdom, interjected, Mr. Nervwell, with all due respect, it seems to me that this incident in France was an isolated event. Therefore, I am inclined to believe that this recent attack falls under the category of the first option. Nervwell nodded, acknowledging All Might's perspective before responding. Your observation holds merit, Mr. Yagi. However, the significance of Perrault's report lies in its detailed nature. We cannot afford to dismiss it as an isolated incident when there are similar accounts emerging from other regions. As the room fell silent, Nervwell's authoritative tone filled the void. Consider Terraza's Nicolas in Spain, stationed in Madrid during the civil unrest. His final transmission paints a harrowing picture, the escalation from antiquated aircraft to the deployment of heavy artillery, reminiscent of the Schwerer Gustav, and the devastation wrought upon cities like Madrid, Toledo, and Valladolid. The abrupt end of his message, cut off by the destruction of his outpost, speaks volumes about the severity of the threat we face. The gravity of Nervwell's words weighed heavily on the assembled leaders and heroes, underscoring the urgency of the situation. The parallels between the reports from France and Spain hinted at a coordinated effort, one that transcended national borders and posed a formidable challenge to global security. As the implications sank in, the necessity for swift and decisive action became ever more apparent, driving the conversation toward strategies for countering the looming threat. Nezu's small, furry form leaned forward, his eyes sharp with curiosity. Are there any other reports about this seemingly endless force? Nervwell nodded, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. Most reports share a consistent message. They indicate that once this force initiates an attack, they show no intention of stopping. In Ionina, Greece, Agent Kikinos Karelia reported encountering soldiers bearing a flag depicting a golden eagle against a blackish-blue background. In other instances, the symbols varied, skulls, spines, and even the heads of Cerberus were observed. The assembled figures absorbed this information, realizing that the force in question possessed a level of organization and symbolism that hinted at a broader, more intricate plan. The revelation fueled a sense of urgency as they grappled with the implications of an unstoppable force descending upon the world, leaving destruction in its wake. Nezu's keen intellect mulled over the potential connections between these symbols, seeking patterns that might provide insights into the motivations behind this relentless onslaught. The aftermath of the meeting saw the participants dispersing, each tasked with specific responsibilities to confront the impending threat. Heroes returned to their agencies, ready to fortify and strategize against the unknown force. Generals left the meeting room with plans to evaluate the military's readiness for a potential invasion, while Nezu, the principal of UA, departed with a USB flash containing vital information from HPSC agents stationed in Europe. 
The chief of police immediately set to work in his office, coordinating efforts to ensure law enforcement was prepared for any potential crisis. Nervwell and Shimizu, driven by a shared determination to uncover more information, directed their respective teams to scour archives and databases for any clues that might shed light on the mysterious force and its intention. In the looming shadows of uncertainty, the collective efforts of heroes, military leaders, and intelligence experts aimed to decipher the cryptic signs of an approaching storm. Their collaboration a testament to the gravity of the situation and the necessity of unity in the face of an unforeseen threat. Meanwhile, Mirko, the renowned hero known for her agility and strength, bounded through the cityscape of Kagoshima in pursuit of criminal activity. Unbeknownst to her, the warehouse she targeted concealed a much more sinister operation than she anticipated. With her characteristic boldness, Mirko crashed through the window, ready to confront the perceived criminals within. To her surprise, she found herself facing not petty thugs but a formidable force of forty men clad in heavy armor, accompanied by what appeared to be trained wolves. The gravity of the situation dawned on Mirko as she realized the magnitude of the threat before her. Unfazed by the overwhelming odds, Mirko raised her fists, prepared to confront the adversaries that stood in her path. Little did she know that she had unwittingly stumbled upon the covert base of Company 4, Division Spine of Army Skull, a revelation that would test her courage and skill like never before. In a dimly lit chamber, buried deep underground, a solitary figure occupied one end of the room. Izuku Midoriya, clad in his customary military attire, stood with a drawer-like machine gun slung over his shoulder, its metallic glint catching the sparse light from a solitary lamp, his face concealed behind a menacing metallic skull mask. He leaned casually against the wall, exuding an aura of quiet confidence. Opposite him sat his enigmatic mentor, Gaimai Krob, surrounded by a formidable assembly of figures. Parade around Gaimai were the admiral commanders of the various armies comprising the NCCAF. Each one bore the weight of their respective commands, their presence a testament to the gravity of the gathering. Among them stood Nikolaus Reuter of Army Forest, a Kahiko Morisada of Army Nuremberg, Tisvetan Mihailov of Army Hebachi, and a host of other distinguished leaders, each representing a vital facet of the NCCAF's military might. Beside the Admiral Commanders stood the wingman generals of the National Crisis Aerial Defense. Stalwart Guardians of the Nation's Skies, Stavros Demetriou of Major Command Defense, Gonkolo Franco of Major Command Invasion, and Constant Van Dale of Major Command Training stood poised for action, their unwavering dedication to duty palpable in the air. Completing the assembly were the Grand Fleet Admirals of the National Crisis Committee Naval Defense, including Stojko Atanasov of Grand Fleet Sturmer, Oliver Cook of Grand Fleet Header, and Matthew and McPhee of Grand Fleet Harp. Their commanding presence underscored the importance of maritime defense in the face of looming threats. Head researcher Baron Kez of the National Crisis Committee Science Corp. and Chairman Tomislav Dordevic of the National Crisis Border Patrol Units added their expertise to the mix, their contributions crucial to the nation's security and stability. Alongside them stood the commanders of the Army Divisions, Naval Fleets, Aerial Wings, and Border Patrol Units, each one a seasoned leader entrusted with the defense of their respective domains. The room resembled a gathering of strategic minds akin to those seen in NATO headquarters, where alliances were forged and plans laid to confront the ever-present specter of global threats. In this chamber, where shadows danced and whispered secrets lingered in the air, the fate of nations hung in the balance. The assembled leaders, bound by duty and resolve, prepared to confront the challenges ahead with unwavering determination and unity of purpose. In this room, from the icy expanses of Siberia to the sun-kissed lands of Iberia, each of you holds a critical role in the unfolding conflict. Guy Microb's voice reverberated with a steely resolve, commanding the attention of all present. The first moves of Protocol Eagle's revenge have been set into motion, and though we bide our time, the seeds of chaos have been sown. A palpable tension filled the air as Gaimai's words hung ominously in the chamber. The League of Villains, under the sinister leadership of All for One, loomed as a dark specter on the horizon, their potential for devastation a harbinger of dire times to come. While the heroes and government officials stand vigilant, their defenses will falter within a month's time, Gaimai continued, their tone laced with calculated anticipation. The veneer of heroism and villainy has weakened Japan's defenses, leaving it vulnerable to the impending storm. Grim determination etched itself onto the faces of those gathered, each one understanding the gravity of the situation. Gaimai's words painted a stark picture of the harsh reality they faced, a world where survival reigned supreme, and allegiances shifted like sand in the wind. The moment our NCC troopers set foot on Japanese soil, they will act as the antibodies to purge the infection of heroism and villainy. Gaimai's voice resonated with unwavering conviction. 
The world has forgotten the primal truth of survival. But we shall remind them, my friends. We shall remind them with the force of our resolve and the clarity of our purpose. A solemn silence enveloped the room, broken only by the weight of Gaimai's proclamation. In the crucible of uncertainty, the resolve of the assembly hardened like tempered steel, their hearts set ablaze with the fire of purpose. For in the shadows of impending conflict, they stood united, a formidable force ready to reshape the destiny of nations and usher in a new era defined by the uncompromising pursuit of survival. Yumseki found herself in the confines of her modest room within Ikta Labs, a space that offered a stark contrast to the oppressive atmosphere she had endured in Keed's house. Despite its simplicity, the room provided a bed, a desk with a chair, and a nightstand, basic amenities that felt like a luxury compared to her previous living conditions. It was a sanctuary within the enigmatic facility that housed her newfound protectors. Having just savored the last morsel of a surprisingly palatable meal delivered by a diligent soldier, Yume decided it was time to venture beyond the confines of her room. The anticipation of exploration fueled her curiosity, and she wondered what secrets Ikta Labs held beyond the confines of her temporary abode. As she approached the door, Yoon could feel a mix of excitement and trepidation. Slowly, she creaked it open, revealing a vast hallway that stretched out before her. The corridor beckoned, enticing her to embark on a journey of discovery within the labyrinthine complex. With each step, Yoon navigated the maze-like halls, occasionally pausing to hide behind walls or other discreet corners whenever soldiers passed by. Surprisingly, her presence seemed to go unnoticed, as if the soldiers were accustomed to the presence of civilians roaming the facility. Her exploration led her past a colossal room filled with an array of towering computers, intricate buttons, and other technological marvels. The hum of machinery and the distant chatter of soldiers indicated that this was a hub of intelligence operations. Hume deduced this as she overheard snippets of conversations, catching wind of a meeting being relayed to a higher authority. The enormity of the room fascinated her, and she couldn't help but marvel at the sheer complexity of the equipment that surrounded her. Soldiers, busy with their tasks, paid little attention to the unassuming girl weaving through the sea of technology. She continued her journey, absorbing the sights and sounds of Ikta Labs. The facility seemed like a hive of activity, with each corridor leading to new wonders and mysteries waiting to be unveiled. Hume's exploration not only allowed her to familiarize herself with the layout of the facility, but also provided glimpses into the intricate workings of the organization that had rescued her from a life of captivity. As she delved deeper into the heart of Ikta Labs, Yum wondered about the motives and goals of the enigmatic group that had taken her in. The meeting she had overheard hinted at a level of coordination and strategy that piqued her curiosity further. Little did she know that her journey within the facility was just beginning, and each step would unravel more layers of the clandestine operations at play within its walls. Yum Seki continued her exploration of Ikta Labs, and to her surprise, she stumbled upon a lounge room tucked away from the more utilitarian sections of the facility. The room buzzed with the chatter of soldiers, their conversations creating a backdrop to the clinks of coffee cups and soda cans. It was a space where the guardians of Ikta Labs could unwind, share stories, and perhaps find solace in the midst of their covert operation. As Yume entered, she noticed the familiar atmosphere of camaraderie among the soldiers. Some were engrossed in discussions while others enjoyed moments of respite, sipping on coffee or soda. Amidst the murmur of voices, one distinct tone caught her attention, a voice she recognized from the past. Ijin, as a fagile, the voice spoke Hungarian, echoing through the room. Hume's ears perked up as she realized it belonged to the man who had kicked down the door during her rescue. Curiosity compelled her to investigate further. Approaching a couch in the corner, Yum saw two individuals seated there. The first was the familiar face, the man who had played a pivotal role in her liberation. Next to him sat someone unfamiliar, a figure with green curly hair clad in a black military uniform, a stark contrast to the grayish-white attire worn by the soldiers in the room. However, what captured Yum's attention was the unsettling metallic skull covering the lower part of his face, leaving only his dark green eyes exposed, eager to unravel the conversation. Yum discreetly listened as the teen, still flipping through a file, spoke, Erdem Aker Mejek. The other man acknowledged him, and with that, the green-haired individual left the room. Seizing the opportunity, Yum decided to approach the man she recognized. As she passed by the mysterious green-haired figure, she received only a passing glance, seemingly unperturbed by her presence. Silently, she took a seat next to the familiar man, who greeted her with a warm smile while leisurely sipping his coffee. In that moment, a silent understanding seemed to pass between them. Hume, driven by a mix of gratitude and curiosity, felt a connection with these individuals who had, in their own way, become her unlikely saviors. The lounge room, with its blend of conversation and quiet camaraderie, became a space where Yume Sek, once a captive in the clutches of the Takuchi clan, found herself on the periphery of a world filled with enigmatic individuals and covert operations. 
Stepping out of Fort Gate, Izuku faced his first mission, the dismantling of the Shai Hasekai. It loomed before him like a formidable challenge, but he embraced it with a determination born from his experience. While Cerberus operated independently under Army Undead, Izuku recognized the invaluable assistance they could provide in terms of intelligence and surveillance. Delving into the organizational intricacies of his forces, Izuku made a strategic decision, despite Cerberus not officially being part of his army. He enlisted their support, aligning them with Division Fisher. Within this division, he meticulously selected three companies to join the mission. Company A, Company B, and Company Y. This calculated move resulted in a deployment of 750 men, each soldier representing a crucial piece in the intricate puzzle of dismantling the Shai Hasekai. As Izuku prepared for this daunting endeavor, he couldn't help but draw parallels to the past. The name Takuchi echoed in his mind, reminiscent of challenges faced and overcome. This mission, Takuchi 2.0 as it seemed, invoked a sense of purpose and resolve. The weight of responsibility wore down on Izuku's shoulders, but with his chosen forces and newfound strategies, he approached the task with an air of confidence, ready to face whatever challenges awaited him in the pursuit of justice. Standing resolute in the harbor of Teichama, Izuku surveyed the intricate belay of troop deployment. The moon cast a silvery glow on the restless waters as massive ships, shrouded in darkness, strategically positioned themselves out of sight. A carefully orchestrated dance unfolded in the dead of night, with smaller vessels discreetly ferrying soldiers to the shore. Accompanying this covert operation were formidable war machines, a fusion of eras as four Mark II tanks, three Airart EV divided by four, and five M1917 light tanks stood poised for action. The sheer audacity of utilizing relics from the Great War intrigued Izuku, a testament to the unconventional methods devised for the mission. As if stepping through the annals of history, these machines, though outdated, were ready to leave their indelible mark on the present. Despite the historical throwback, Izuku found solace in the fact that the soldiers donned modern armor, offering a semblance of familiarity amid the temporal dissonance. The weaponry, a mix of FNP 90 seconds, franchise spas 12 seconds, and AAI ACRs, provided a bridge between eras, seamlessly blending the contemporary with the remnants of the past. Izuku grappled with the surreal nature of his mission. The dichotomy of ancient war machines juxtaposed against soldiers armed with weapons from a semi-modern era added layers of complexity to the narrative. Yet, amidst the temporal melange, Izuku's determination remained unwavering, a beacon guiding his forces through the uncharted waters of Operation Teitama Landing. Tamura Shigaraki reclined in a dimly lit booth at the heart of the League of Villains base, their notorious bar. Behind the counter, Kirajiri, the loyal servant, meticulously cleaned a glass. Meanwhile, Tamura's gaze fixated on what once was his right hand, now replaced by a cold, metallic prosthetic. The fateful sniper shot had mercilessly torn through most of it during the unsettling events at the USJ. In the quiet solitude of the bar, Tamura grappled with the stark reality that he could only satisfy the persistent itch on his neck using his left hand. The physical manifestation of his past encounter served as a constant reminder of the challenges and setbacks he faced. As the leader of the League of Villains, disappointment lingered like a haunting specter, a testament to the harsh toll exacted by their ongoing conflict. Sensei's voice echoed through the confines of the League of Villains base, emanating from the television. Tamura, do not mope around with your hand. If you have a setback, you must find a way to overcome it, Sensei's commanding voice advised, cutting through the dim atmosphere of the bar. The reminders were clear. Failure was not merely a dead end but a chance for growth. And while the USJ was a failure, it was also a success, as the heroes have lost a valuable ally. The words hung in the air, both a rebuke and an encouragement. Tamura, still grappling with the physical reminder of his defeat, absorbed Sensei's wisdom. The line between success and failure blurred in the complex dance of their ongoing conflict. And Tamura found himself at a crossroads, contemplating the path forward for the League of Villains. What do you mean, Sensei? Tamura questioned, seeking clarity in the cryptic message. Sensei, ever enigmatic, leaned into the explanation. What I mean is, the one with the animal quirk has seemingly defected. When they held him trapped in a hospital to arrest him, he managed to escape. So, while he might not be a current League of Villains member, maybe in the future he will prove to be a valuable asset. The revelation added a layer of intrigue to the situation. A potential ally, once deemed an adversary, was now on the loose, and Sensei saw an opportunity in this unexpected turn of events. Tamura pondered the possibilities, his mind weaving through the intricacies of alliances and betrayals that define the volatile world of villains and heroes. As Sensei spoke, Tamura's mind involuntarily connected the dots. He knew exactly who his master was referring to, that boy, Midoriya Izuku. A surge of emotions swept over Shigaraki, emotions he had long buried beneath layers of disdain and apathy. 
However, this time, a new and unsettling feeling emerged from the depths of his consciousness, fear. The name echoed in his mind, a reminder of an encounter that left an indelible mark on Shigaraki. The boy with a tenacious spirit and a power that defied the norms had not only thwarted their plans but had also managed to elude capture. The unpredictable nature of this unexpected adversary sent a chill down Shigaraki's spine, awakening a sensation he hadn't experienced in a long time. The prospect of facing Midoriya Izuku again brought forth an unsettling realization. The League of Villains might have underestimated the gravity of their encounter with the young hero. Sensei's voice, laced with a mix of disappointment and anticipation, continued to reverberate through the bar. But now we must seek newer members. How did the talk with Stain go? Kirajiri, maintaining his composure, responded, Not good, sire. His view would make him side with the heroes if it really got that far. A heavy sigh emanated from Sensei, acknowledging the setback. As expected, so he's back in Hasu right. The question hung in the air, the implications clear. Stain, the once considered ally, had become an unreliable asset, leaving the League of Villains in a precarious position. Sensei's pursuit of recruiting like-minded individuals faced yet another obstacle, one that required a strategic reevaluation of their plans. First Sergeant Major Andridge C. Verbulize, now elevated in rank due to the proliferation of 5th, 6th, and 7th generation clones, found himself alongside Sergeant Stanislav Liepa and Master Sergeant Mihail Zaglidis, all hailing from Latvia's Kuldiga. Their shared history, reaching back to childhood, offered little explanation for the surreal scene before them. What, you may wonder, provoked such bewilderment. None other than the presence of the fifth-ranked heroine, Mirko, securely bound before them. It appeared she had stumbled upon a hidden warehouse, attempted to single-handedly confront a formidable force of forty armed men, and unfortunately, met with failure. Now, the trio of Latvians faced the unusual task of standing guard over the captive heroine. The room echoed with an awkward tension as the Latvian soldiers exchanged uncertain glances. The captured Mirko, her indomitable spirit undiminished despite her predicament, glared defiantly at her captors. It was a scenario none of them had anticipated, and the responsibility of detaining a prominent hero weighed heavily on their shoulders. As they stood sentinel in the makeshift confinement, the trio reflected on the absurdity of the situation. How had they, soldiers from a distant land, found themselves guarding a superhero in a clandestine encounter? The circumstances prompted a flood of unanswered questions, but duty demanded their focus. Mirko's attempts to free herself were met with stoic resilience from the Latvian soldiers, their duty overriding any personal sentiments. The warehouse, dimly lit and filled with an air of secrecy, held an atmosphere that seemed incongruent with the heroism and villainy typically associated with Mirko's exploits. Meanwhile, Holy Mother of God Seema's O'Floin, Patriarch of the O'Floin family, stood on the harbor of Tarumizu, a witness to the unfolding spectacle as soldiers disembarked one after another from the ships. The acceptance of various clans, O'Floin, Poloski, Hunjo, Chiba, Sanada, Humni, Rzeziki, Okimura, So, Unger, and Bodolo, into the Black Eagle network marked a momentous occasion. Gathered around Simas were representatives of these clans, each bearing the weight of their decision to join this clandestine network. Shiharu Hanjo, known as Miss Hanjo in the criminal underworld, was the sole leader who had personally aligned with the Ben. The others had opted to send emissaries to represent their interests. Before them unfolded a display of power and unity. Five different companies from Division Spine, operating under the banner of Army Skull. The arsenal at their disposal included tanks, APCs, artillery, and even horses, illustrating the comprehensive nature of their military force. As Seamus surveyed the scene, he couldn't help but marvel at the convergence of diverse clans under the Black Eagle network. The air crackled with anticipation and a sense of historic collaboration, transcending regional and familial boundaries for a shared purpose. The representatives, standing shoulder to shoulder, exchanged nods and subtle gestures, silently acknowledging the gravity of their decision. The harbor, once a symbol of trade and commerce, had transformed into a staging ground for a formidable alliance. The soldiers, clad in the distinct insignia of Division Spine, moved with practiced precision, a testament to the training and discipline instilled in them. The acceptance of the clans into the Ben represented not only a consolidation of power, but also a strategic alliance capable of influencing the delicate balance of power in the criminal underworld. Seema's O'Floin, patriarch and key player in this intricate game, felt the weight of responsibility on his shoulders. The choices made in the coming days would shape the destiny of not just the O'Floin family but the broader Black Eagle network. As the representatives conferred and strategized, the harbor echoed with the sounds of military preparations, boots on the ground, the rumble of engines, and the occasional whinny of horses. Seema's O'Floin, surrounded by allies and newfound partners, braced for the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead in this unprecedented chapter of the criminal underworld's history. 
In the midst of the unexpected tableau, the soldiers couldn't help but ponder the intricacies of the global conflicts they found themselves embroiled in. Their service, initially rooted in the defense of their homelands, had evolved into a complex web of alliances, conspiracies, and encounters with extraordinary individuals. As the hours passed, the room remained a tableau of contrasts. The Latvian soldiers, symbols of disciplined order, juxtaposed against the bound hero, a symbol of unconquerable will. The trio continued their duty, mindful of the responsibilities bestowed upon them, yet unable to shake the surreal nature of the circumstances they found themselves entangled in. Company F, Company G, Company H, Company J, Company K, and Company L. The authoritative voice of Command Sergeant Major Reed Christophers reverberated across the assembly. The soldiers, bearing the insignia of Division Spine, snapped to attention, their focus undivided as they awaited their orders. We are here for one thing and one thing only, Christophers declared with unwavering determination, to pave the way for the National Crisis Committee's armed forces to take over. Army Skull, under new command, now has more than a million soldiers to its name. Division Fisher is holding Shizuoka, with Division Cerberus, under Army Undead, aiding them. But us, Kagoshima is ours. The weight of the mission hung in the air as Christophers outlined their purpose in Kagoshima. The soldiers, a formidable force, were entrusted with a pivotal role in the larger strategy of the National Crisis Committee. Christophers, a seasoned leader, conveyed the urgency and significance of their mission with every word. As he spoke, the soldiers felt a surge of collective purpose. They were not just participants in a military campaign. They were the vanguard of an organization with grand ambitions. The mention of Army Skull's expanded forces emphasized the scale of their operation and the impact they could wield on the unfolding events in Japan. The soldiers, clad in their uniform bearing the mark of division spine, exchanged determined glances. Each company understood the gravity of the situation and the responsibility that came with being the spearhead in Kagoshima. Christopher's words echoed in their minds as they prepared to embark on a mission that would shape the course of their future and the destiny of the National Crisis Committee. Amidst the charged atmosphere, Command Sergeant Major Reed Christophers led the soldiers forward, signaling the commencement of their march. The harbor, once a scene of alliance building and strategic maneuvering, now witnessed the disciplined and purposeful advance of Division Spine towards Kagoshima, a critical juncture in the unfolding narrative of the National Crisis Committee's influence in Japan. The criminal families have long reigned over Kagoshima, unchecked by heroes who stand idly by, with the police taking no action and the HPSC even aiding some of them. The time has come to purge Kagoshima's criminal underworld. We have gathered 30 to 40 men who have gone around recruiting any clan willing to accept our cause. Those who reject us. Well, that's precisely why we're here, isn't it? Command Sergeant Major Reed Christopher's voice boomed with conviction as he addressed the assembled soldiers. The atmosphere was charged with a sense of purpose, the soldiers readying themselves for the task ahead. Christopher's continued to rally them, igniting a fervor among the ranks. Everyone, ready your weapons. Prepare your vehicles. Kagoshima will witness that no one will protect the criminals any longer. Yura. The rallying cry echoed through the harbor as the soldiers, now fully mobilized, geared up for their mission. Each soldier carried the weight of their duty, the responsibility to bring justice to a city plagued by criminal influence. Christopher's words resonated with the collective determination of Division Spine and the march toward Kagoshima had begun, a resolute force intent on bringing about a reckoning in the heart of the criminal underworld. As Sima surveyed the unfolding scene, a sense of gratitude washed over him, and he couldn't help but feel relieved that he had accepted the offer. The harbor of Tarumizu buzzed with activity as soldiers, representatives of various clans, and the formidable companies of Division Spine prepared for the decisive mission ahead. The acceptance of different clans into the Black Eagle network marked a significant shift in power dynamics. The Ofloin, Poloski, Hanjo, Chiba, Sonata, Humni, Rizizuki, Okimura, So, Unger, and Bodolo clans had come together under a common cause, aligning themselves with the National Crisis Committee's armed forces. Representatives of these clans, including the formidable Chiharu Hanjo, stood alongside Simas, united in purpose. The sight of the gathered forces, complete with tanks, APCs, artillery, and even horses, underscored the gravity of their commitment. Command Sergeant Major Reed Christopher's impassioned speech resonated across the harbor, reaffirming their shared mission to cleanse Kagoshima of its criminal elements. Seamus felt a surge of pride knowing that he was part of a force capable of making a real difference. As the soldiers readied themselves, Seamus knew that the path ahead would be challenging, but the camaraderie among the clans and the might of Division Spine instilled confidence. With Kagoshima as their target, he braced himself for the unfolding chapters of this operation, ready to play his role in reshaping the destiny of the city and securing a future free from the shackles of criminal influence. The once thriving city of Kanoya lay in ruins, a testament to the destructive force unleashed upon it. 
Clan Anaconi, which had long held dominance over the city, now faced an unprecedented onslaught. In the wake of the merciless artillery barrage, Kanoya had been reduced to a chaotic landscape of destruction. Amidst the remnants of what was once a bustling metropolis, Daiki Shimada, the son of Yuzuru Shimada, found himself confronted with the cold barrel of a gun. Before he could utter a word, the deafening sound of a gunshot resonated through the air. The bullet tore through his frontal lobe and exited through his cerebellum, silencing any potential resistance. Around him, the lifeless forms of his father, cousins, and fellow clan members lay scattered, victims of the ruthless assault. The devastation extended beyond the Anakoni clan, affecting the smaller Kuroiwa, Yashinaga, and Shimada clans that had coexisted in Kanoya. The once diverse and vibrant community now lay in ruins, its streets stained with the blood of those who once called it home. The origin of this catastrophic event could be traced back to five. The moment when the first artillery shell had mercilessly struck Kanoya. The precision and scale of the attack left no room for escape, obliterating entire clans and reducing the city to a somber testament of ruin. As the echoes of destruction lingered in the air, Kanoya stood as a haunting symbol of the price paid in the pursuit of power and control. The once mighty clans now lay vanquished, their legacy erased amid the debris of a city that had become a mere shadow of its former self. Commander Florian Nemen of Division Cerberus, stationed in Ikta Labs, received a seemingly straightforward order that carried far-reaching consequences. His mission, sever the communication lines linking Kyushu Island to the mainland. With a simple press of a button, Nemen executed the command, plunging Kyushu into a sudden and eerie silence. The effects were immediate and widespread. Hospitals found themselves without power, unable to communicate crucial information. Airports were paralyzed, unable to coordinate with incoming and outgoing flights. The once connected region now stood isolated, cut off from the rest of Japan. The strategic significance of this action went beyond mere disruption. By disabling communication lines, the local branches of the HPSC, heroes, police, and military in Kyushu were rendered voiceless. Their ability to coordinate responses, share intelligence, and seek external assistance came to an abrupt halt. The city of Kagoshima, nestled in the heart of Kyushu, felt the impact most profoundly. As the rest of Japan remained in the dark about the sudden blackout, the local population grappled with the immediate consequences of the communication blackout. Uncertainty loomed large, and the true extent of the situation would only become clear in the ensuing months. The decision to sever the communication lines was not just an act of disruption. It was a strategic move with implications that would reverberate across the nation. Only time would reveal the full extent of the repercussions, leaving Japan to grapple with the aftermath of a covert operation that had plunged one of its key regions into isolation and uncertainty. In the bustling harbor of Taipei, a formidable invasion force was assembling, marked by the imposing presence of battlecruisers from Fleet H-1A, the flagship being NCV Keelung. The fleet was a sight to behold, a mix of modern and inter-World War-era naval power, showcasing the versatility of Grand Fleet Harp. Transport ships laden with historic Citroën Kigress M23S and tanks from a bygone era stood ready for deployment. Among them were modern aircraft carriers carrying a fleet of biplanes and inter-World War-era planes, representing a unique blend of technology spanning different eras. The troops assembled for the impending invasion hailed from Division Honeybee and Digger B of Army Nuremberg. These seasoned soldiers, well-trained and equipped, prepared to embark on a mission that would soon see them landing on the shores of Kagoshima Prefecture. While the larger fleet H-1A focused on Kagoshima, a smaller but equally determined fleet, H-2A, set its sights on the Okinawa Islands. Consisting of sloop of war, man of war, and aged frigates, this auxiliary force aimed to secure the surrounding islands and complement the main invasion effort. As the naval forces readied themselves in the harbor, the tension in the air was palpable. The impending invasion promised to reshape the strategic landscape, marking a significant chapter in the unfolding conflict. The combination of historical and modern military elements underscored the gravity of the operation, as both Grand Fleet Harp and Army Nuremberg prepared to project their might onto the shores of Kagoshima. The massive battlecruiser, NCV Shengman, slowly began to raise its anchor, a colossal piece of machinery creaking against the weight it held. The surrounding ships, equally imposing in their stature, followed suit. The sea beneath them seemed to hum with anticipation as the formidable fleet H-1A commenced its journey towards the distant Kagoshima prefecture. The naval convoy, a mix of sleek modern vessels and echoes of bygone naval eras, set forth with a purposeful and determined demeanor. The wake left in their path marked the beginning of a mission that would unfold on the shores of an unfamiliar land. As the fleet sailed through open waters, the crew aboard each ship engaged in their respective duties. 
The rhythmic sound of waves crashing against the hulls accompanied the low hum of engines, creating a symphony of motion that reverberated across the fleet. On board the NCV Shengmen, officers and sailors worked in harmony to ensure the vessel's readiness for any encounter that might arise. The ship's commanding presence sliced through the waters, leading the charge with an air of authority. The journey ahead held uncertainty and the fate of Kagoshima Prefecture hung in the balance. Fleet H-1A, with its diverse assembly of ships, moved forward as a unified force, propelled by the collective determination of its crew. The horizon, once an expanse of endless sea, now framed the promise of a significant military engagement. The sun dipped low in the sky, casting long shadows across the decks of the naval convoy, as they sailed steadily towards their destination, ready to unfold the next chapter in the ongoing conflict. The city of Hyoki, once a bustling urban center, now bore the scars of war as the echoes of artillery fire faded away. The streets, once filled with the sounds of daily life, were now eerily silent, disrupted only by the distant howling of wolves. Company J of Division Spine had rolled through the city with an imposing display of military might. Panzer IIIs, Volkswagen Kubelwagens, NSD, KFC, two seconds rumbled through the streets, their presence evoking memories of a bygone era. The unmistakable clatter of wartime machinery filled the air as soldiers in period uniforms and gear patrolled the city, their faces concealed by helmets reminiscent of World War II. In a surreal twist, more than 200 Alexander Archipelago wolves, a formidable addition to the invading force, moved alongside the military convoy. Their presence, a testament to the unorthodox tactics employed by the new Admiral Commander Midoriya added an element of primal intimidation to the unfolding scene. Survivors, their homes reduced to smoldering ruins, watched helplessly as the heroes who had valiantly tried to resist lay lifeless amid the wreckage. The police and the remnants of the local military, no match for the overwhelming force that had descended upon them, had retreated to the relative safety of the police station, desperately barricading themselves against the impending onslaught. The once vibrant city had fallen silent, the weight of the invasion casting a shadow over its streets. The invaders, with their mix of modern and historical military assets, pressed forward with a cold and calculated determination, leaving the fate of Hyoki hanging in the balance. As the city's skyline crumbled, the invaders tightened their grip on Kagoshima Prefecture, setting the stage for a chapter of chaos and upheaval. The atmosphere in Class 1 was unusually solemn as they awaited the start of the UA Festival. Two empty desks stood as stark reminders of absences. One belonged to Minor Amita, who had dropped out following the USJ incident, and the other belonged to Izuku Midoriya, whose reason for absence remained a mystery. As Shota Aizawa, still bearing the scars of his recent battles, entered the room, the students watched with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. Momoye Arazu, ever the voice of reason, was the first to raise her hand, her concern evident in her expression. As Sensei, why is Midoriya absent from class? She inquired, her voice betraying a hint of unease. Aizawa's response was measured, his weary eyes betraying the internal struggle he faced. He requested leave of absence for personal reasons. Aizawa replied, his tone grave. Though his words seemed straightforward, a shadow lingered in his eyes, hinting at a deeper truth hidden beneath the surface. Unbeknownst to the class, the reality of Midoriya's absence was far more sinister. The Hero Public Safety Commission had deemed him too dangerous to remain free after his actions during the USJ incident. Plans were in motion to transport him to Tartarus, a high-security prison for superpowered individuals. However, mere hours before the scheduled transfer, Midoriya managed to evade capture. Using a concealed pistol, he broke free from his restraints and escaped into the night. A mysterious black Monterey Mercury whisked him away, his current whereabouts shrouded in uncertainty. As the class grappled with the news of Midoriya's disappearance, they couldn't help but wonder about the true nature of his personal reasons and the implications of his sudden departure. The UA Festival, meant to be a celebration of their achievements, now carried an undercurrent of uncertainty and concern, casting a shadow over the proceeding. In a dimly lit room stained with the lingering scent of fresh blood, Izuku Midoriya sat in a cold, contemplative silence. The room bore witness to a gruesome scene, and the atmosphere hung heavy with tension. The only solace in the room was a flickering cigarette, its ember casting an eerie glow on Midoriya's face. Addressing the other occupant of the room, he spoke with a chilling calmness. Namoto Shin, I suggest you speak now, before the real torture begins. His words resonated with a sense of foreboding, setting the stage for a dark confrontation. Namoto Shin, a man strapped to a chair with his wrists confined by unforgiving metal constraints, remained silent, his stoic facade betraying no signs of fear or compliance. The air thickened with an unspoken challenge. Well then, don't say I didn't warn you, Midoriya murmured, his tone devoid of emotion. The room descended into an oppressive silence as he reached for a scalpel, a sinister instrument in the dance of intimidation. 
With methodical precision, Midoriya began to make small, deliberate cuts on Nomoto Shin's hands. The metallic tang of blood filled the air as the scalpel danced, leaving a macabre trail of crimson in its wake. The Yakuza member, bound and subjected to the unrelenting torment, maintained a stoic silence, refusing to yield to the pain. As each cut marked a moment of brutality, the room bore witness to a clash of wills, Midoriya's relentless pursuit of information against Nomoto Shin's unwavering resolve. The shadows in the room seemed to grow darker, mirroring the depths of the darkness that had consumed Midoriya's soul. The fate of Nomoto Shin hung in the balance, entwined with the enigmatic circumstances surrounding Midoriya's sudden disappearance from Yue. The consequences of this twisted interrogation promised to cast a long shadow over the unfolding events, leaving a trail of unanswered questions in its wake. In the aftermath of the grim interrogation, Izuku Midoriya found himself immersed in a web of intrigue. The report in his hands unveiled a disturbing revelation, bullets crafted with the blood of a child, capable of erasing quirks. The cruel ingenuity behind this sinister creation echoed the depths to which the Yakuza had sunk. The child's quirk, labeled Rewind, held the potential to undo the very fabric of existence. As Izuku delved into contemplation, his mind wrestled with the implications of his own abilities. Gaimai, the enigmatic force that propelled him beyond the realm of humanity, possessed powers that transcended quirks. The revelation that there might be more to his abilities than initially perceived left Izuku grappling with a new layer of uncertainty. The report not only provided insights into the drug-erasing bullets but also unveiled the location of the Shai Hasekai compound. Armed with this crucial information, Izuku knew that the time for decisive action had come. His phone, gripped tightly in his hand, became a conduit to unseen forces as he dialed a singular number, that of Command Sergeant Major Herbert Konigsman, the leader of the formidable company A, B, and Y. As Konigsman's voice resonated through the line, Izuku's command was clear and resolute, Konigsman, ready the forces for a raid. The urgency in his tone conveyed the gravity of the impending mission. The clash between Cerberus and the Shai Hasekai, each harboring their own shadows and secrets, promised to unravel a saga of darkness that had remained hidden for far too long. The stage was set for an encounter between the relentless force of Cerberus and the insidious machinations of the Shai Hasekai. In the shadows of their looming clash, the fate of many hung in the balance, and the echoes of the impending raid resonated in the night, a symphony of unseen forces converging for a reckoning that would pierce the veil of secrecy and reveal the true nature of the darkness that lurked within. Nezu, the perceptive and intelligent principal of Yue, found himself confronted with a perplexing puzzle. Seated in the conference room with his trusted staff, he observed a screen displaying an unsettling sequence of events involving Izuku Midori. The footage captured Midori waking up in his hospital bed, engaging in a mysterious conversation over the phone, and swiftly dispatching an officer with a concealed pistol. The revelation that a small mouse had been covertly listening and from the vents of Yue added an additional layer of intrigue. The possibility of a traitor within the walls of Yue itself cast a shadow over the institution's security. Nezu couldn't dismiss the notion that Midoriya might have been privy to sensitive information, raising questions about his connections and loyalties. To further complicate matters, Midoriya's childhood dream of becoming a hero clashed with the ruthless actions he had taken against villains. The incongruity between his aspirations and recent deeds left Nezu and the staff grappling with uncertainty. In an effort to unravel the enigma, Nezu had conducted a thorough interrogation with Midoriya's mother, hoping to glean insights into the young man's motivations. However, the information only deepened the mystery, leaving Nezu to ponder the complex web of deception that surrounded Midori. As the staff contemplated the implications of these revelations, the specter of a traitor within Yue and the conflicting nature of Midoriya's actions loomed large. The shadows of uncertainty stretched across the once hallowed halls of Yue, and Nezu knew that untangling this web of deception would require more than just keen intellect. It demanded a confrontation with the elusive truth that lay at the heart of the enigma called Midoriya Izuku. So what? It was probably just an act, scoffed Vlad King, known to family as Sekijiro Kan. Eraserhead, or to friends, Shota Aizawa interjected. Apparently, he had always, since he could talk, wanted to be a hero, and doing an act at age three or four would be very unlikely. Vlad King sneered, so, he'd probably changed somewhere between life before Yue. He was quirkless for most of his life, right? So that means that he probably had something happen to him that made him go to villains. And he's a teenager, it wouldn't be very hard to catch him, right Nezu? Nezu was dead silent, and Sekijiro's face began to fall a bit. Unfortunately, Nezu began, the police have searched the entire Musutafu, and with his abilities to create birds, he would see any threat coming from miles. Not only that, but we don't know the driver of the car that drove him away. The room was filled with a heavy silence as the implications of Midoriya's disappearance and the uncertainties surrounding his allegiance hung in the air, casting a pall over the once-confident educators of Yue. All Might, or Tashinori Yagi, sighed deeply, 
It's such a shame to see such great potential go to villainy. Nezu shook his head and then spoke, according to the testimonies of both Asui Tsuyu and Minta Minor. When both students asked why he had so ruthlessly killed the water villains by making the waters infested with sharks, piranhas, and crocodiles, Asui stated that heroes aren't supposed to do that. He replied with a simple who said I wanted to be a hero. So it appears that Kan's perspective does hold some truth. The weight of disappointment and confusion lingered in the room, leaving an uneasy atmosphere among the gathered heroes. This time present Mike, or his Ashi Yamada, spoke up. But at the exams, he was doing his best, not forced best. Why would he do that Nezu then answered? That raises our third issue. After seeing how he talked to Shigaraki or treated the other villains, it has been concluded that he doesn't work with the League of Villains. Now then, the problem is that we are not sure who he would be siding with. But there is one suspect, and after today, believed to be the main cause of Izuku's change of heart, a man by the name of Krob Gaimai. On the screen came a photo of the supposed suspect. The man's notable features were ink black hair, the whites of his eyes void black, his irises bright white, a smile that seemed to carry a tone of danger. But the most notable of them all was his skin made of tar, not just the color, but seemingly composed of actual tar. The photo showed him from the head to the shoulders, wearing a white shirt with a black tie and a tan campaign hat. Nezu continued, This man is the founder of multiple small companies, all under one conglomerate, Eagles Incorporated. He owns a weapons company called Krob Weapons Industries, a few scrapyards under the name Rosenfeld Scrap Dealers, and multiple stores under Badger Everyday Store, all located in the Knight District. And do you want to know an interesting detail? He is a cousin to Midoriya's father and, therefore, an uncle of Midoriya, one whom Midoriya met just before the UA exams. Now that isn't the main issue, Nezu continued. However, there was a villain attack in the night district a few minutes before Midoriya escaped, and who might have done that attack? A new photo is shown, this time it's a blurry one, right before the camera was a black blur. Those are flames. The man who took this photo is dead, but the phone survived. Now, let's take a closer look. Just in the corner of the camera was another blur. It was a figure. The skin of this figure was tar black. Glowing white dots were all that was seen of the eyes, and his left hand was aimed at the camera. And with that, the pieces fell into place for most of the people present. He's the one who did the attack, right? Yagi asked. Nezu nodded. He's the main suspect. Now, when the police tried to find his house, nobody was there. After a few hours of searching, a gas leak blew up the house, taking the investigators with it. All his assets were to be seized, but they were all already empty. Not only that, but a day before the first day of UA for the first years, a criminal clan that ruled the eastern part of the Knight District was brutally killed. While the real perpetrators of the massacre are still unknown, there are witnesses who claim they saw one of the men without a mask. That man had ink black skin, and his eyes seemed to glow, indicating that Krob Gaimai is also the main suspect in that case. Midnight, or Nimari Kayama, sighed deeply, the weariness evident on her face. So, we have one student who dropped out, another defected to a villain, an unknown villain who just made himself known, and reporters demanding an explainable story this isn't how I imagined the new year to start. Eraserhead, also known as Shota Aizawa, added his thoughts, and I still need to tell the students the real story. For now, I've informed them that Midoriya is on requested leave, and that will only last two weeks. Nezu hummed thoughtfully, his tiny form seated at the head of the conference table. We have a news conference tomorrow. I believe it's best to explain anything non-classified there. While this may look somber, the students still rely on us, Aizawa and Kan. I want you two to start encouraging some students to seek counseling with Hound Dog to help them deal with emotional scars. To the rest of you, ensure that the other students in the general department don't engage in anything idiotic. I wouldn't want to suddenly get swarmed by a bunch of people when I just saw a classmate slaughter a group of villains with no mercy. Now then, this meeting is finished, Nezu continued. But if anyone thinks they have a lead, report it to me first. You all are dismissed. And with that, the meeting came to an end, leaving the staff members to grapple with the challenges that lay ahead. The atmosphere in the hallway grew tense as Aizawa left the room leaving Night Owl, the substitute, to take charge. The bell signaled lunchtime, prompting the students to rise and head for their much-needed break. However, their progress was abruptly halted by a gathering of students from the general department, support course, and even some from the management course. The encircling crowd created a sense of entrapment, causing unease among the hero course students. Bakugo, ever quick to voice his opinions, spoke up amidst the encroaching crowd. These people are seeking out competition for the sports festival and they want to scrutinize the students who survived a villain attack. Seems like 1B is dealing with a similar situation. He sneered. Indeed, the students of class 1B found themselves surrounded by peers from other courses, amplifying the tension. Out of the way, shitbacks. Bakugo's declaration reverberated through the hallway. Murmurs and hushed conversations followed. 
Some expressed surprise at finding someone with such an attitude in the hero course. Others questioned whether the hero course was truly filled with such disdainful individuals. Amidst the commotion, a purple-haired student stepped forward, offering a cryptic piece of advice. Well, can't say I'm surprised, but you all should make sure that you don't lose that position. Confusion swept through class 1 until Momoye Irazu provided clarity. He's talking about replacing us. In the sports festival, if a general education student is deemed to perform better, they can remove one of us and replace them with that student. Fear crept into the hero course students as the ramifications of potential replacements sank in. Whispers of concern echoed through the crowd. However, one voice spoke out against the audacity of the situation. The nerve muttered someone in the crowd. The purple-haired student, catching wind of the comment, attempted to respond. But before he could finish his sentence, a swift tongue slap from Tsuyuasui silenced him. You don't know anything, she exclaimed, leaving a stunned crowd in her wake as she stormed off. As the students who had surrounded class wanted dispersed to tend to their hunger, the hero course students made their way to the cafeteria. Fate, it seemed, had dictated that only two tables were unoccupied, forcing the first-year hero classes, 1A and 1B, to sit adjacent to each other. Despite the tension from the earlier confrontation, some students found solace in engaging conversations with their counterparts from the sister class. At the right corner of the table, Suyuasui sat in silence. Numerous attempts were made to inquire about her well-being, but she remained tight-lipped. The students at the table, however, sensed the weight of her trauma. As one of the closest witnesses to Midoriya's rampage, Asui had endured the horrifying spectacle alongside Mind. The latter had chosen to drop out, but Asui persevered concealing her emotional wounds behind a stoic facade. The visceral images of villains meeting gruesome fates, devoured by crocodiles and sharks while piranhas nibbled at the remains, had undoubtedly left an indelible mark on her psyche, an experience that set her apart in terms of trauma among her peers. Amidst the clatter of trays and the chatter in the cafeteria, unspoken understanding rippled through both Class 1A and Class 1B. As they savored their meals, the realization dawned upon them that, Come the sports festival, a segment where multiple teams would be assembled could potentially pit them against the collective might of other classes. It was a fundamental concept that bore the weight of impending challenges, hinting at a future where alliances forged during this seemingly ordinary lunch might determine their fate in the competitions ahead. The unspoken agreement lingered in the air, setting the stage for a clash that could shape the course of their hero academia journey. Izuku found solace in the vast expanse of the farm fields surrounding Musutafu, the golden hues of the crops swaying gently in the breeze. Seated next to a freshly dug hole, he cradled a Colt M1911 in his hands, its cold metal offering a stark contrast to the warmth of the countryside. As he patiently awaited the approaching vehicle, the promise of confrontation loomed in the air. With the distant hum of an engine drawing near, Izuku retrieved another cigarette, the tendrils of smoke mingling with the anticipation that hung around him. A black car emerged on the horizon, and with a calculated certainty, he extinguished the cigarette, turning his attention to the gun in his hands, sliding the barrel back and forth. He loaded the weapon with the practiced ease of someone who had walked a darker path. The car came to a halt, and three soldiers disembarked, escorting a man with a bag shrouding his identity. With a swift removal, the bag revealed Yu Hojo, a member of the notorious Eight Precepts of Death. Quirk suppressing cuffs adorned his wrists, a feeble attempt to contain the potential threat he posed. I presume you're acquainted with the eight precepts of death, Mr. Hojo. Izuku's voice cut through the air, cold and unwavering. The restrained man feigned ignorance, uttering a denial that Izuku was quick to dismiss. Your associate Namoto, he spilled the details. Now, you have a choice. Enlighten me on how to infiltrate the Shai Hasekai compound, or suffer the same fate as your unfortunate friend here. In the beam of a soldier's flashlight, the lifeless form of Nomoto Shin was revealed in the hole, a chilling testament to the consequences of defiance. Izuku locked eyes with Yu Hojo, the unspoken threat hanging in the air as the farm fields whispered secrets only they could comprehend. The choice lingered in the balance, an unspoken negotiation amid the tranquil backdrop of the countryside. The man's derisive scoff echoed through the fields, a testament to his defiance in the face of impending consequences. Always knew he was a rat, he sneered, his tone laced with disdain, and no, you can go fuck yourself. Izuku's laughter cut through the tension, a stark contrast to the gravity of the situation. Oh well, he remarked nonchalantly. Not like it matters much. An explosion can always break through. And if that isn't enough, well, I'll just get some more. And hey, at least you won't be able to help your boss. Hojo's expression shifted, a mixture of confusion and disbelief contorting his features. The hell does that am his words were abruptly cut short as Izuku's resolve found its mark. In a swift and decisive motion, the Colt M1911 discharged, the bullet finding its home in Hojo's forehead. 
The man's body slumped to the ground. The weight of his defiance silenced in an instant. Izuku's gaze shifted to one of the soldiers, a faceless figure with the designation B3-1778. Name, he inquired, prompting the soldier to respond with military precision. B3-1778, sir, rank private. Izuku acknowledged the information with a thoughtful hum. A clone, huh? All right, could you bury the bodies then? Also, one of you, radio the signal for the attack. When you're done, make your way to the Yakuza compound. The clone promptly saluted, a testament to the discipline instilled in its creation. With determined efficiency, it began the solemn task of burying the fallen, carrying out its orders in the eerie quietude of the fields. Izuku, unfazed by the grim aftermath, approached his vehicle, a sleek BMW R25 motorcycle. The engine roared to life as he kicked it into gear, the powerful machine ready to carry him to the next phase of his mission. With a twist of the throttle, he maneuvered out of the desolate scene, leaving behind the clandestine echoes of his pursuit. With that single gunshot, the fate of two of the eight bullets was sealed, their allegiance to the shy Hasekai forever severed. In the quiet expanse of the farm fields, the echoes of the gunshot lingered, a haunting reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the tranquil facade of rural life. The day of the UA Sports Festival had finally arrived, bringing a palpable mix of excitement and tension to the air. The expansive stadium buzzed with energy as students from various courses gathered to showcase their talents and compete against one another. Banners adorned with the UA logo fluttered in the wind, setting the stage for a spectacle that would captivate not only the students but also the spectators filling the stand. In the hero course waiting area, Class 1A and 1B stood side by side, their anticipation evident in the animated chatter that echoed within the designated space. Aizawa, now recovered from his injuries, kept a watchful eye over his students while the substitute hero, Night Owl, maintained an air of vigilance. The first event was the obstacle course, a challenging race designed to test the agility, speed, and strategy of each participant. The air crackled with an amalgamation of quirks as students prepared to showcase their abilities. In the midst of the crowd, Midoriya's absence lingered as a silent reminder of the recent upheavals. The buzzer sounded, and the students burst into action, navigating through swinging pendulums, collapsing bridges, and various obstacles that pushed their limits. Akugo led the charge with explosive bursts, closely followed by Todoroki and other familiar faces. The hero course students showcased their prowess, determined to maintain their reputation. Meanwhile, Class 1B's Monoma, Fueled by an unyielding desire to prove his class's worth, strategized and mimicked quirks to gain an edge. The course unfolded as a battleground of wits and powers, each student carving their path amidst the chaos. As the dust settled and winners emerged, the collective gaze shifted towards the next event, leaving an air of anticipation for the battles that awaited in the festival's subsequent stages. The sports festival had begun, and UAS aspiring heroes were ready to leave an indelible mark on its storied history. The next event in the sports festival was the Cavalry Battle, a team-based competition that required strategic alliances and clever use of quirks. The students huddled with their teammates, formulating plans to secure points and advance to the next round. Class 1A, driven by a mix of camaraderie and determination, devised a strategy that involved Midoriya's quick and agile mobility. However, his absence left a void in their plan. As they adapted on the fly, they relied on the explosive power of Bakugo, the ice manipulation of Todoroki, and the speed of Ida to maintain their competitive edge. On the other side, Class 1B embraced Monoma's tactical approach, mimicking a variety of quirks to gain versatility. While some students questioned the absence of Midoriya, others were focused on proving their individual strengths and the prowess of their class. As the cavalry battle commenced, the arena became a flurry of action, with students jockeying for position and forming alliances on the fly. Quirks clashed, strategies unfolded, and unexpected alliances formed and dissolved in the blink of an eye. In the midst of the chaos, a mysterious figure observed from the shadows, hidden among the spectators. Clad in a dark hood and obscured by the bustling crowd, the observer's gaze focused on the unfolding events with an intensity that hinted at a deeper interest in the proceeding. The buzzer sounded, marking the end of the cavalry battle. Class 1 and 1B reflected on their performances, strategizing for the upcoming one-on-one -on -one battles. Little did they know that the sports festival held more surprises and challenges, setting the stage for unexpected encounters and tests of strength and resilience. The air was thick with anticipation as UAS aspiring heroes readied themselves for the next phase of the competition. In the heat of the cavalry battle, alliances shifted like sand in a desert storm, and clashes between teams were as unpredictable as the quirks themselves. Class 1A found themselves entangled in a skirmish with a team from the support course, led by Mei Hatsum, the eccentric inventor known for her gadgetry prowess. Her team's contraptions added a layer of complexity to the battlefield, forcing Class 1A to adapt quickly. 
Bakugo, fueled by his explosive temper, led the charge, unleashing blasts of fiery explosions to create chaos among their opponents. Meanwhile, Yuraka utilized her gravity manipulation to disrupt the support course's gadgets, sending them spiraling off course. At the same time, Todoroki and Ida worked in tandem. Their teamwork is seamless as a well-choreographed dance. Todoroki's ice-encased opponents, creating obstacles that slowed their progress, while Ida's swift movements allowed him to navigate the battlefield with unparalleled speed. As the dust settled, Class 1 emerged victorious, their teamwork and adaptability proving to be their greatest assets. Yet, their triumph was short-lived as they found themselves face-to-face -face with a formidable opponent, Class 1B, led by the strategic mind of Monoma. Monoma's team, comprised of individuals with unique quirks, posed a formidable challenge. They moved with precision, exploiting weaknesses and capitalizing on opportunities with calculated efficiency. The clash between Class 1A and Class 1B was intense, each side pushing themselves to the limit in pursuit of victory. Mid-battle alliances formed and dissolved, as students sought to gain the upper hand in the chaotic melee. Amidst the chaos, Midoriya's absence loomed large, leaving Class 1 at a disadvantage. Yet, they refused to yield, drawing strength from their bonds and determination to prove themselves as worthy competitors. The cavalry battle raged on, a testament to the tenacity and spirit of UAS aspiring heroes. With each clash, they honed their skills and forged bonds that would carry them through the challenges yet to come in the sports festival. The cavalry battle continued to unfold with relentless energy and unpredictability. As Class 1A clashed with Class 1B, the arena became a battlefield of quirks, strategies, and alliances. Ada, with his incredible speed, zipped through the chaos, dodging attacks and attempting to snatch headbands from unsuspecting opponents. He raced against Class 1B's Juzo Honnuki, whose softening quirk proved to be a clever defense against Ada's speed. Meanwhile, Bakugo, never one to back down from a challenge, faced off against Tetsu 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 whose steel-hardened skin could withstand Bakugo's explosive blasts. The clash of explosions and metal echoed through the arena, each determined to outmaneuver the other. Midway through the battle, an unexpected alliance formed between Takoyami of Class 1 and a Wace of Class 1B. Their quirks complemented each other well, Takoyami's dark shadow providing a formidable offense, while Oasis' willed quirk mended their defenses. The dynamic shifted again when Monoma, with his quirk copy, temporarily mimicked Uraraka's gravity manipulation. The sudden change caught Class 1 off guard, leading to a momentary scramble to adjust their tactics. As the dust settled and the battle reached its climax, the intensity of the competition heightened. Class 1A, with their resilience and adaptability, managed to secure a commendable position, but the challenges were far from over. The sports festival continued to unfold with thrilling battles, showcasing the diverse talents and strategies of UAS aspiring heroes. With each match, the students gained valuable experience and faced the growing pressure to prove themselves in the eyes of their peers, teachers, and the watching world. The dust settled, and the echoes of the intense cavalry battle slowly faded away. The air was filled with anticipation as the loudspeakers crackled to life, announcing the results and the students who would advance to the next stage of the sports festival. Attention, everyone. After a fierce battle, we now have the results of the cavalry battle. The teams that will advance to the next round are as follows. The tension in the arena reached its peak as the names were about to be revealed. The crowd held its breath, eager to see which teams had demonstrated the most skill, teamwork, and strategic prowess. The announcer continued with a dramatic pause. In first place, we have Class 1A, led by Tenya Ida, followed closely by Class 1B, led by Juzo Honnuki in second place. And in third place, it's Class 1A's Katsuki Bakugo. Cheers erupted from the stands as the names were announced. Class 1A celebrated their success, while Class 1B acknowledged their respectable performance. The students who secured a spot in the next round wore determined expressions, knowing that the challenges ahead would only intensify. The crowd eagerly awaited the subsequent events of the sports festival, ready to witness more thrilling battles and impressive displays of quirk ability. The competition was fierce, and the students were determined to prove themselves as the future heroes of UA. The stadium buzzed with energy as the final event of the sports festival was about to begin. The remaining contestants, fueled by the spirit of competition, gathered on the arena floor, ready to showcase their skills in the one-on-one -on -one battles. The loudspeakers echoed through the stadium, announcing the commencement of the one-on-one -on -one matchups. The tension rose as the first pair of competitors stepped forward, facing each other with unwavering determination. First up, from Class 1A, we have Shoto Todoroki. The crowd erupted in cheers as Todoroki with his distinctive heterochromatic eyes and half-and-half -half hairstyle, entered the arena. His opponent, a student from another class, stood across from him, prepared for the impending clash. The battle unfolded with a display of incredible quirks, strategic maneuvers, and intense combat. 
Each successive match brought new surprises and showcased the diverse talents of UAS aspiring heroes. As the battles continued, certain contestants emerged as standouts, capturing the audience's attention with their unique quirks and tactics. Midoriya, who had been absent from the festival, remained a mysterious figure, leaving the spectators curious about his fate. The clashes became more intense with each passing moment, and the stadium's atmosphere crackled with excitement. Heroic aspirations clashed, and rivalries intensified, creating an unforgettable spectacle that would be etched into the memories of both students and spectators alike. The final event of the UA Sports Festival proved to be a thrilling showcase of talent, determination, and the indomitable spirit of the aspiring heroes. As the day concluded, the stage was set for the next chapter in the journey of these young students, each striving to become the symbol of peace and justice they aspired to be. With a casual click, the television screen went dark in the League of Villains hideout. Shigaraki, tasked with monitoring the UA Sports Festival, had neglected his duty and now he found himself catching up on the highlights. Restlessly scratching his neck with his left hand, he absorbed the crucial information. Stain's location had become a priority. Although they knew he was in Hasu, the exact whereabouts remained elusive. In a few days, the League of Villains planned to launch an attack to capture the infamous hero killer, Kirajiri. Coffee, Shigaraki barked, and with unwavering loyalty, Kirajiri, the ever-present bartender and portal master, promptly fulfilled the request. The tension in the hideout hinted at the impending clash between heroes and villains, each side preparing for the next phase of their ongoing struggle for dominance. As the trucks rumbled through the streets of Musutafu, a mysterious cargo hidden beneath wrappers and sheets, a sense of anticipation hung in the air. The convoy came to a halt near a seemingly ordinary compound, office buildings surrounded by a protective fence. Vans, joining the procession, disgorged the formidable 250-man strong company of Division Fisher. The unveiling began as the sheets covering five imposing M1917 tanks were removed, revealing the roaring behemoths beneath. The soldiers, some equipped with riot shields, formed a protective line in front of the tanks. Simultaneously, Company Y orchestrated a similar unveiling, showcasing their four Mark II tanks. Meanwhile, Company B, split into two groups, prepared to serve as backup with 30 Kodiak bears each. Gas masks adorned every soldier's face, emphasizing the gravity of the situation. A soldier armed with a grenade launcher fired a shot, launching a canister of tear gas through a window, signaling the commencement of their operation. The streets of Musutafu were now caught in the crosshairs of a meticulously planned military maneuver. The deafening explosion echoed through the air as one of the tanks from Company A strategically blew up an entrance, creating a breach for the operation. The smaller-sized tanks, designed for agility, led the charge as they smoothly entered the compound. Following closely behind, the well-trained troops from Company A flooded in, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. The Shai Hasekai compound, once a fortress of secrecy, was now exposed to the relentless advance of Division Fisher. In Eri's small room, the alarms had finally ceased, but an eerie tension lingered in the air. Trembling with fear, she hid under her bed, the unfamiliar noise unsettling her. Moments later, Overhaul entered, bringing a directive that disrupted the relative calmness of her hidden sanctuary. Eri, come out now. We're going on a small trip, Overhaul commanded. Fearful of the consequences of defiance, Eri reluctantly emerged from her hiding spot. She took the hand offered by the imposing figure, unaware of the chaos unfolding above ground. On the surface, the Shai Hasekai compound had turned into a battleground. Kendo Rappa, once a formidable force, found himself overwhelmed by the sheer strength and ferocity of four Kodiak bears. Toya Satsuno, targeted by a sniper, suffered a fatal bullet wound to the head. Riki Akatsukame fought valiantly against the joint force of Mark II tanks and Kodiak bears, but the odds were slowly turning against him. Soramitsu Tabe writhed on the ground, affected by the tear gas canister he had unwittingly encountered. Deidoro Sakaki met his demise when a shell from a Mark II tank found its target. Hekaji Tengai's once formidable barrier began to crack under the relentless assault of three M1917 tanks. The battlefield, a gruesome tableau of fallen Yakuza and NCC soldiers, bore witness to the violent clash between Division Fisher and the Shai Hasekai. In the dimly lit underground passages, Chronostasis confronted the infiltration team from Company B, led by none other than Izuku himself. The air was thick with tension as the clash between the Yakuza henchmen and the NCC soldiers unfolded. Heroes, Chronostasis declared, a smirk playing on his face. You'll get no further. The irony of the title wasn't lost on Izuku, who found it amusing given the circumstances. Determined to deal with the underlings first, Chronostasis unleashed his hair, resembling arrows, aimed at the soldiers. Two members holding riot shields managed to keep the hair at bay, but they noticed their movements slowing down as a result. Izuku suppressed a chuckle, realizing the peculiar nature of the situation. Everyone, don't let the hair hit you. In fire, 
Izuku commanded. The soldiers, those still capable of moving efficiently, began to shoot at Kronostasis. The Yakuza member dodged the gunfire skillfully, narrowly avoiding getting hit. In retaliation, Kronostasis released his hair once more, managing to strike another soldier, Clone B Forminus 567, in the side of the neck. Man down, one of the soldiers called out. As Kronostasis continued to weave through the onslaught, his hair striking with precision, Izuku observed the situation. A strategic insight struck him. Keep him moving. He won't be able to use his quirk that way. Izuku ordered. The soldiers, quick to adapt, continued their relentless assault. If one needed to reload, another seamlessly took over the gunfire. Kronostasis, now constantly in motion, found it challenging to unleash his hair effectively. However, Kronostasis wasn't solely reliant on his quirk. With swift and calculated moves, he took down two more soldiers. But Izuku had an ace up his sleeve, a quirk of his own. Ten marbles slipped between his fingers, and with a throw, ten brown hyenas materialized, ready to join the underground fray. The trio of Eri, Overhaul, and Mimic navigated the labyrinthine hallways, slowly making their way toward the surface. As they emerged into the open air on the other side of the compound, they remained oblivious to the unseen threat looming in the shadows. High above, a sniper patiently observed their movements, evaluating the situation. A radio transmission crackled to life, providing a directive, the man, make sure to just kill him. His quirk is too dangerous. And for the girl, leave her alone for now. All right, the sniper responded, aligning the crosshairs on overhaul. With a measured breath, they took the shot. The bullet soared through the air, a deadly trajectory aimed at the Yakuza leader. The outcome of this single moment would have profound consequences for the unfolding conflict within the Shai Hasekai compound. The first bullet tore through the air, finding its mark on overhaul's shoulder. The Yakuza leader grimaced in pain, dropping to a knee as he instinctively clutched at the wound. Before he could peel off his glove to trigger his quirk and mend the injury, a second shot rang out. This time, the bullet struck with deadly precision, penetrating over Hall's forehead. The force of impact sent him sprawling backward, lifeless. The sniper, hidden in the shadows, had successfully neutralized the formidable figurehead of the Shai Hasekai. The consequences of this decisive act rippled through the compound, setting the stage for what would unfold in the wake of Overhaul's demise. Amidst the chaos, Mimic's desperate plea for Eri to reverse Overhaul's fate went unanswered. The sniper, Reiner Abel, remained hidden, claiming his second victim with a calculated shot that silenced Mimic forever. Meanwhile, Kronostasis, overwhelmed by the relentless assault from the soldiers and their animal allies, suffered a gruesome demise. A brown hyena tore into his arm. Another blow came in the form of a shotgun shell to his stomach and the final stroke was delivered by Izuku, who swiftly dispatched him with a fatal gunshot to the head. The once formidable enforcer of the Shai Hasekai fell to the combined might of the invaders, leaving the underground compound in turmoil. Gaimai, unfazed by the carnage that lay before him, strode into the battlefield with an air of calculated composure. Surveying the wreckage of the once mighty tanks, he nonchalantly flicked his finger, and with a mere gesture, the discarded machines vanished into the ether, leaving no trace of their former presence. However, the corpses of the fallen soldiers remained as stark reminders of the brutal conflict that had unfolded. Out of the 750 men who had embarked on the raid, only 233 emerged from the chaos unscathed. The toll exacted by the Yakuza was significant, a testament to their formidable resilience and tenacity. Despite the staggering losses, victory had been achieved, albeit at a steep price. None of the Yakuza members had survived the onslaught. Those who managed to cling to life were swiftly met with justice in the form of execution. The decisive battle had brought an end to the reign of the Shai Hasekai, marking a pivotal moment in the struggle for control over Musutafu's underworld. Izuku observed the small, horned girl sitting amidst the aftermath of the violent clash. Two high-ranking Yakuza members, felled by a sniper's bullet, surrounded her. Despite his lack of emotional connection to her, he felt a certain responsibility. It didn't sit right to leave her alone in this gruesome scene. Kneeling down to her eye level, he gently addressed her, Hello, Uri, I presume. The girl, hidden behind a red blanket, nodded in acknowledgement, sensing the trauma she endured. He delicately broached the subject. I'm guessing that the one with the bird mask didn't do good things to you, correct? Uri flinched but affirmed with another nod. Would you want to go somewhere where you won't be hurt like that? Izuku inquired. Uri, cautiously peering from behind her blanket, nodded again. Extending his hand, he presented her with a choice. Well, I think I know a place. It's your decision. You can come with me, or you can go with the police and heroes when they arrive here. Confused but curious, Iri asked, Um sir what is a hero? Izuku contemplated his response, deciding on a simple explanation, they are people who claim to save others. Her eyes brightened a bit at the thought. When she questioned if he was a hero, Izuku shook his head, no, far from it. Heroes don't kill other people, 
I do. Harry's gaze saddened. But before they could dwell on it further, another voice disrupted the moment. Well, then, I suggest you two make a decision. Stage 2 of the plan will begin soon. Gaimai's voice echoed, signaling that the situation required immediate attention and action. Harry nodded, acknowledging Gaimai's plan to take her to Ikta Labs for safety. Gaimai assured Izuku, well, then, I'll get her to Ikta Labs. She'll be safe there. Now, we'll see each other in a few weeks in Tartarus. Now go, the police should be here any second. Izuku nodded, offering reassurance to Iri. Well, Iri, that man in black, you can trust him. He won't do any harm. Iri, while cautious, slowly approached Gaimai. He opened a portal to Fort Gate, also known as Ikta Labs, and as they both went through, the portal closed behind them. With the distant wail of approaching police sirens, Izuku took a moment. He sat on his knees, hands on his head, contemplating the events that transpired. The second stage of his plan loomed ahead, involving the recruitment of certain individuals. Some would be receptive, others resistant, but they all shared one common destination, Tartarus. Izuku focused on his task, meticulously planning his recruitment strategy for Tartarus inmates. In the dimly lit cabin on Mount Kita, he studied a pinboard adorned with a simple yet crucial plan. His first target, Lady Nagant, also known as Kiana Tsutsumi, presented a challenge. Having already been utilized by one organization, she might be reluctant to join another. Izuku acknowledged the difficulty but decided to prioritize other potential allies for now. One such candidate was Ludger Bar, infamously known as the Butcher. Originally hailing from Schlademing, Austria, Bar found himself in Japan. His quirk, the butcher's pride, fueled his desire to inflict harm on various beings. Skilled with a cleaver, Bar had a dark history of killing at least a dozen people. Despite his disturbing nature, Izuku saw potential in leveraging Bar's lethal capabilities. Next on the list was Moonfish, or Koji Ono, infamous for his cannibalistic tendencies. Izuku acknowledged that most of the individuals he sought were indeed nutcases. Nevertheless, he found utility in their predilections, especially when directed toward his enemies. Rianamita, known as Puppet Master, possessed a unique quirk named Puppeteer. With the ability to control people using strings from her fingertips, she offered a potent asset. While she, too, had a history as a serial killer, Izuku remained pragmatic, recognizing the potential these individuals had when given a specific target. As he delved into the details of each potential recruit, Izuku understood the risks involved in his plan. It required precise execution, starting with the imminent raid on the Yakuza compound. His path was set, prepare for the raid, get captured, and navigate the challenges that awaited him in Tartarus. The success of his plan rested on his ability to turn these formidable individuals into allies, each with their own dark inclinations. Present in the interrogation room, Izuku found himself handcuffed to a table, facing an HPSC interrogator. The agent wasted no time in laying out the demands, seeking information about how Izuku had amassed his forces, acquired equipment, details about his affiliations, and his recent activities. Izuku, displaying a calm demeanor, challenged the agent's expectations. What if I don't spill the beans? Izuku asked defiantly. The agent sighed, presenting an ultimatum that seemed almost reasonable, offering the prospect of a career as a hero under the Hero Public Safety Commission if Izuku cooperated. However, if he chose silence, Tartarus awaited him for a lifetime. Unfazed, Izuku hummed dismissively. Welp, guess I ain't saying shit. The agent, taken aback by Izuku's lack of compliance, attempted to reason with him, acknowledging that they were willing to overlook some of his actions. They urged him to cooperate, emphasizing the potential for a lighter sentence. Izuku, however, shook his head, fully aware of the limitations they faced. We both know you can't do that, Izuku retorted calmly. It's the decision of the jury. Right now, I'm looking at about 50 to 60, maybe even 71 first-degree murder charges. Maybe second. To make it easier for you, I confess. I got some mercs, paid them, got in contact with a weapons dealer, got enough weapons, attacked a Yakuza hideout, and all that. So now you can't really change anything. His words hung in the air, a testament to his unwavering resolve and the complexities of the situation. The agent, perplexed by Izuku's apparent indifference, pressed further, questioning his knowledge of Tartarus and expressing concern about his affiliation with the League of Villains. Why would you do that? You do know what Tartarus is, right? The agent inquired. Of course, I really couldn't care less where you send me. Nothing will really stop what's happening. Maybe delay it a bit, Izuku replied cryptically. He dropped a hint about the League of Villains, enough to make the agent suspicious. So, you work for the League of Villains? The agent probed. Izuku maintained his silence, allowing the agent's imagination to wander. Who knows? Who knows? I know this is getting recorded, so you all have enough evidence to put me away, right? Izuku asked rhetorically, confident that he had sowed enough doubt. 
I mean, yes, we do, the agent responded. All right then, there's no reason to continue this. Bye bye, Izuku concluded, leaving the agent with a mix of confusion and frustration. Two police officers entered the room, escorting Izuku to the holding cell. Surprisingly, he complied without resistance, leaving the agent to puzzle over the enigmatic suspect's true motive. Izuku, now sentenced to life imprisonment, donned the standard prison attire. The harsh reality of his situation became more palpable as he received the identification number 877821, a stark reminder of his new life behind bars. The familiar sound of cuffs echoed in the air as he was restrained, and he was ushered into the armored transport van that would take him to his new confined existence. The heavy door closed, sealing his fate within the confines of the correctional system. Izuku, seemingly indifferent to the harsh conditions, anticipated that his stay in Tartarus would be short-lived, perhaps no more than a month. As the transport vehicle navigated the path to Tartarus, the prison guards exhibited their authority with stern demands. Izuku, however, remained unfazed, cooperating without protest. Upon arrival, he underwent a thorough search, and his cell, surrounded by impenetrable armor, became his new temporary abode. An ankle bracelet laden with quirk suppressors encircled his leg. Though it was mere theatrics, as Izuku intended to play along, seated on his bed, he bided his time, patiently waiting for what would come next. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard members near the Kagoshima coast were taken aback by the unexpected sight on the horizon, a colossal aircraft carrier. Perplexed by the absence of prior information from the JSDF High Command, they watched in astonishment as the massive ship loomed on the seas. Meanwhile, aboard the NCVI Hajirika, preparations were underway. Squadron An-11 of Wing Ardell readied its aircraft comprising 22 planes, including 10 Heinkel He 50 seconds and 12 Halberstadt CL. Aye eyes, the squadron geared up for action. The roaring engines and spinning rotors signaled the launch, with the planes setting their sights on an unsuspecting small boat. The Heinkel He 50 seconds lined up for a dive-bombing mission, ready to unleash their payload. Hey, Iwasaki, do you think those planes are getting too close to us? One Coast Guard member asked his partner. Iwasaki responded nonchalantly, Nah, probably just part of an air show or something. Unbeknownst to them, three Heinkel He 50 seconds from the squadron initiated their dive, releasing their bombs. Suddenly, Iwasaki's realization struck. Shit, Shinoda, get off the- He began before the bombs hit their mark, causing an enemy vessel to sink. The Coast Guard members were left in shock at the unexpected attack. Shinoda swiftly grabbed his radio, urgency in his voice, and signed Shinoda Hayate reporting. We've just been attacked by what appeared to be biplanes. Our vessel sustained damage and requires immediate repairs. We may need backup. However, there was only silence in response. Shinoda's concern grew as he realized the line to home base was dead. Iwasaki, the line to home base is dead. Is that normal? He asked, turning to his partner for answers. Iwasaki's response was grim. No, it isn't, he said, seizing the radio. This is Lieutenant Iwasaki Noriaki. We are under attack by biplanes and urgently request backup. Still, there was no reply. Damn it, are the batteries dead or something? All right, everyone, man your stations. Shoot down those planes, Iwasaki ordered, rallying the remaining Coast Guard members. Meanwhile, Ensign Fukui Yu managed to take down one of the He 50 seconds using the Orlikan 20mm cannons on the patrol ship. However, their victory was short-lived as a Halberstadt CL. Two broke formation, its observer swiftly retaliating with the Parabellum MG-14 and taking out Ensign Fukui Yu in a matter of moments. The situation grew increasingly dire as the enemy planes continued their assault. Lieutenant Colonel Recep Tilki, the squadron leader of AT-11, gazed on with a stoic expression. Every man in his squadron was a second-generation clone, and Tilki himself had long lost any desire to preserve his life. All men, get ready. This ship must sink at all costs. If we can't sink it, then damage it so the next squadron can take over, he commanded. And with that order, the planes descended upon the ship. A He-50 dove in, releasing its bomb, but was met with gunfire and eventually crashed into the water. Silky, determined, aligned a shot, managing to bring down two assailants and tearing them to shreds with his LMG-8 divided by 15. The enemy soldiers fell lifeless on the ship, Tilki pressing forward with his mission. As the battle raged on, most planes from AT-11 were gradually shot down, plummeting into the water below. However, the last E-50 managed to deliver the finishing blow. With a final strike, the ship began to sink, succumbing to the relentless assault. Amidst the chaos, the six surviving aircraft from AT-11 turned back, making their way back to the aircraft carrier. Their mission was accomplished, leaving behind a scene of destruction and turmoil on the open seas. As the surviving aircraft returned to the carrier, the absence of Recep Tilki among them was evident. His plane, along with the others, sank to the bottom of the ocean, 
leaving behind a lingering sense of sacrifice. The mission had been completed, but at a heavy cost. A2-9881 disembarked from his plane, holding the position of flight lieutenant within his squadron. Following protocol, he made his way to report to the designated superior officer. With a crisp salute, he addressed the colonel, Colonel Meuse, sir. The colonel surveyed the returning aircraft, a question in his eyes. Lieutenant Colonel Tilke, he inquired. A2-9881 delivered the summer news, dead, sir. He perished after enemy fire brought down his plane. Colonel Meuse nodded gravely. Very well, congratulations, you are now Lieutenant Colonel. Henceforth, your official name will be Wessel Dijkstra. How does that sound? Sir, yes, sir, responded the newly appointed Lieutenant Colonel Dijkstra with another salute, before returning to his squadron. Back in the prison cafeteria, Izuku sat alone at a table, observing the dynamics of the room. Cliques formed naturally, with some inmates keeping to themselves while others gathered in groups. His gaze swept across the space, recognizing faces and potential recruits among them. Kiana Tsutsumi sat solitary and he decided against approaching her for now, respecting her space. Instead, his attention settled on Ludger Bar, who occupied a table mostly to himself with only a few others in his company. Nearby sat Moonfish, Mita, and Akabe, individuals Izuku considered as potential allies in his future plans. Choosing the end of their table, Izuku settled in, adept at blending into the background thanks to his experiences in Aldera. Amidst the mundane routine of prison life, he partook of the unappealing prison fare, biding his time for what lay ahead. Mita was the first to notice Izuku's presence, giving him a casual glance. On the other hand, Bar, with a gruff demeanor, questioned, And who are you? New around here? Well, I don't blame you for taking a seat at an empty spot. But next time, find somewhere else, all right. Only killers sit here. Izuku nonchalantly responded, Do 71 first-degree murder charges count? Mita chuckled, intrigued, Wow, what happened to cause so much death? Izuku hummed, Oh, just a villain attack at my school. I unleashed my quirk, which ended up taking care of a lot of them. Akabe whistled, asking, What kind of quirk do you have then? Izuku replied casually, I can summon any animal. In that situation, I unleashed some wolves and bears, and they took care of the rest. Akabe raised an eyebrow and asked, And you're called? Izuku casually swallowed a piece of his food, replying, Midoriya Izuku. Don't think you would recognize it anyway. Moonfish remained silent, twitching occasionally, while Bar seemed lost in thought. Bar then exclaimed, Oh, you're the arrested hero student. Yeah, when the news played a bit in the courtyard, there was a conference about some hero school or something. Apparently, some student had gone bonkers and killed a whole lot of people. So, any normal hero student wouldn't be talking to maniacal killers. What's the difference? Izuku shrugged. I mean, I think I recognize you. Oh uh, yeah, Butcher, was it? Killed about 40, maybe 50 people? I mean, I killed more, so there's no real difference between us. And why would I care? I'm locked in here for life anyway. Wouldn't want to be scared of people who I will see for the rest of my life in here. Mita then spoke, and would you know who I am? Izuku calmly grabbed his water cup, taking a sip before responding, Puppeteer Master. You killed 78 to 83 people, stringing their bodies up with strings as if they were puppets. You got captured by Yoroi Musha and then sentenced to life here, right? She nodded and giggled a bit. Kid knows his stuff. What about my buddy, Koji over here? She asked as she placed a shoulder over Moonfish, who once again didn't say anything, only giving a small growl. Moonfish cannibalized a family of five. Only the daughter of the family survived, bearing bite marks on her neck. I don't remember who took him in, though. Ad shot was the only thing Moonfish said before returning to his subdued state. Me decide. He's still salty about how he didn't manage to eat the poor girl. Oh well, not like he'll be able to eat anyone again soon. He's going to the chair in a few months. Aren't you excited, Koji? She giggled, almost like a girl in a candy store. As the meal continued, Izuku observed the interactions around him. The prison cafeteria buzzed with subdued conversations, and the atmosphere remained tense. It looked like Izuku had identified three potential recruits for his plan. Izuku moved silently through the prison courtyard, his presence unnoticed by most. He had cultivated an unusual camaraderie with a group of notorious inmates, Bar, Mead, Akabe, and Moonfish. Although the connection was more strategic than genuine, it served his purposes well in this unforgiving environment. Leaning against a cold metal wall, Izuku heard a voice he recognized but hadn't expected to encounter so directly. I know you're watching me. If you have something to say, say it, Kiana Tsutsumi remarked, her voice tinged with a mix of curiosity and defiance. Izuku's response was measured. Not here to offer compliments, just observing. Someone close to me had a lot to say about you. It's intriguing to finally meet the real person behind the stories. Kiana raised an eyebrow, skeptical of Izuku's interest. Most people wouldn't bother with a fallen hero in prison. What's your angle? Izuku explained, it's not about heroism or villainy. 
more about how you managed to outmaneuver someone he considered competition. Hiana's expression shifted as she processed Izuku's words. And who would that be? I've crossed paths with many adversaries. Izuku's response was blunt. Nishiyama Washi, the 41st president of the HPSC. Tiana's features tightened, a mixture of surprise and irritation. The commission keeps its secrets well hidden. How would you know about that? Izuku's tone remained neutral. Family ties. My uncle, who I mentioned earlier, harbors a deep resentment towards the HPSC. It's resulted in some significant repercussions for the commission. Kiana's lips quirked into a wry smile. So, you're kin to a terrorist. That certainly piqued my interest. Izuku chuckled. Terrorist is quite the heavy label, don't you think? I prefer to see him as a well-informed member of society. Kiana snorted in response. Sure, kid. So, how did you end up in this lovely establishment? Izuku nonchalantly shrugged. Got a task from my uncle, and I'm just carrying it out. Kiana's eyes narrowed. Very enlightening. Ignoring the sarcasm. Izuku continued, I try my best. Anyway, ever heard of the NCC? Kiana looked genuinely puzzled. Can't say I have. Izuku smirked. Well then, it seems you're in for quite a story. Kiana couldn't deny her intrigue with the kid. He had been observing her from the moment he arrived. And their initial conversation left her with mixed feelings. There was something distinctly different about him compared to the typical teenagers she had encountered in prison. Firstly, he didn't exhibit the usual behaviors she experienced from others, no lecherous glances or inappropriate comments. Instead, his gaze remained fixed on her eyes. Second, while most young people idolized heroes, he expressed admiration for a military organization with destructive plans for Japan, coupled with a disdain for the Hero Public Safety Commission. Thirdly, his composure was uncanny. In a facility housing individuals who had wiped out entire cities, he displayed an unusual calmness while engaging in conversations with them. And lastly, the kid had an eccentric uncle teaching him about weaponry, poison, and an array of other subjects. All in all, Kiana found herself both puzzled and intrigued by the enigmatic teenager. Kiana found herself seated at the same table as the peculiar kid, surrounded by an assortment of other criminals, each with their own dark tendencies. Mita, the white blonde woman, was currently engrossed in a conversation about inflicting mass harm. Bar, a brown-haired man with red eyes, chimed in with his thoughts on torture, while Moonfish, or Ono, simply muttered about eating flesh. Akeb offered a more direct approach, lighting up a public gathering. The conversation then turned to the kid, Midoriya, and his perspective. He responded with a calm, contemplative hum, suggesting cutting off the electricity grid in a densely populated area as a means of causing widespread chaos. He continued with various suggestions, including derailing a bullet train and deploying sarin gas grenades, all delivered in a seemingly absent-minded mutter. Kiana observed how Mita enjoyed these peculiar musings, seemingly the only one understanding the intricate details of his thoughts. The kid's mind worked in a way that both fascinated and disturbed her. Ben, I think I remember a briefing about something like that was it Black Eye Network or something. Izuku shook his head, Black Eagle Network. I think my uncle knows three members of that thing profiler, smiles, and contractor. Wouldn't know where they are, though. Kiana hummed, HM. So kiddo, you're very familiar with the criminal world. Why would that be? Izuku chuckled, wanted to be an underground hero. My uncle said it was best to know a lot about the underground, quoting Sun Tzu while he said it. As the days passed, Kiana didn't realize it yet, but she found herself getting excited about something to look forward to. Her time in Tartarus had made her forget that feeling, but slowly she began to get used to her new acquaintances in the prison. A few months had passed since Izuku's entrance into the confines of Tartarus, and in that time, he had meticulously crafted a small group, comprised of individuals he deemed valuable for his plans. Although he refrained from explicitly stating they were a group, the members naturally gravitated towards each other, a subtle influence exerted by Izuku. As the group solidified, Izuku recognized that it was time to extend his offer, to gauge which among them would be willing to join him in his intricate plan. Gathering Mead, now known as Rene, Ludger, Moonfish, and Akabe, Izuku prepared to present his proposal. All right, I have something to tell you all, Izuku began. Rene, with her seemingly cheerful demeanor, inquired, Oh, and what would that be, Izuku-chan? Izuku, however, remained vigilant, having received lessons in manipulation from Gaimai. He responded with a polite smile, I have an offer for each of you. Are you interested? Ludger, ever direct, prompted Izuku to reveal the details. Well, tell us what it is first, sensing the opportune moment. Izuku looked around and smirked as the cameras mysteriously went offline, a calculated move signaling the imminent unveiling of his proposal. Well, you see, I have this little plan that would truly disrupt the prison. With its success, I could easily make my exit. However, I also have job opportunities for a select few. You see, I'm a part of an organization with a lofty goal that involves eliminating a significant number of people. I'm here to recruit individuals who might be intrigued by such a proposition. 
Rene, always quick to embrace the unexpected, declared, count me in. Ledger, displaying his nonchalant attitude, remarked, not like I have something else to do. Moonfish, with a low growl, conveyed his agreement. Rena interpreted, he said sure in his own way. Most members had willingly agreed to Izuku's proposal, except for Kiana, who displayed uncertainty. Miss Tsutsumi, Izuku addressed her, acknowledging her past experiences. While I know of your history, you're not obligated to join. You could simply escape and go your own way. Kiana, after a moment of contemplation, reluctantly voiced, Fine, but it better not turn out like the last time I joined a group. Izuku chuckled, easing her concerns. One of the goals of this group is to dismantle the commission. Don't worry, they may be many things. But hypocrites isn't one of them. As the individuals within this unlikely alliance align themselves with Izuku's plan, the intricate web of relationships, motivations, and secrets continued to unfold within the confines of Tartarus. The offer had been extended and the consequences of their choices would undoubtedly shape the trajectory of the unfolding narrative. Several more months had passed within the confinements of Tartarus, and the prison population had seen some additions. Stain, the notorious hero killer, had been apprehended by Endeavor, narrowly avoiding killing one of Izuku's former classmates. Muscular, affiliated with the League of Villains, had found his way into Tartarus after his assault on the summer camp, adding a surreal twist to the situation. All for one now occupied a few cells downward. The presence of such a powerful and infamous villain within arm's reach was both unsettling and intriguing. It seemed like Gaimai's foresight had proven accurate, predicting the influx of notorious individuals into Tartarus and the potential chaos that could ensue. According to Gaimai's guidance, the League of Villains would orchestrate a plan to break out their true master, all for one. In the ensuing chaos, Izuku's small group of recruits would seize the opportunity to escape, aided by the formidable Division Cerberus. The prison environment had become a volatile mix of formidable individuals, each with their own dark histories and motivations. The looming presence of All for One added an extra layer of tension to an already unpredictable situation. As the narrative continued to unfold within the prison walls, the dynamics between the characters and the impending events hinted at a tumultuous future. In the quiet confines of his cell, Izuku was on the verge of sleep when the blaring alarm shattered the tranquility. Simultaneously, the cell lights flickered off and the doors swung open. It was an anticipated event for Izuku, and he moved calmly toward the designated meeting area. Unbeknownst to him, his quirk-suppressing bracelet had quietly fallen off. Above ground, in the presence of All for One and members of the League of Villains, Izuku awaited the arrival of those who had accepted his offer. Ludger Bar, Rinamita, Moonfish, and Hiroto Akabe were present, but Kiana Tsutsumi had yet to appear. Patience prevailed as Izuku lingered, watching for her eventual arrival. When Kiana finally joined the group, a nod from Izuku signaled that it was time to proceed. Well then, let's get going. With that, a member of Division Cerberus materialized, revealing a hole in the prison wall. On the other side, more Division Cerberus soldiers awaited, and in the distance, the sea glistened with the promise of escape. A small boat patiently bobbed in the water, ready to ferry them away. The assembled group, now the new members of Army Skull, embarked onto the waiting boat. As it sailed away, leaving Tartarus behind, the prisoners within the once impregnable walls roamed free. With a sense of purpose, they marched towards the city, marking the beginning of a new chapter in their unpredictable journey. In his military uniform, the black body armor and metallic lower skull mask completing the ensemble, Izuku stood in anticipation, surrounded by the motley crew that had successfully broken out of Tartarus. Each member sat in standard-issue uniforms, a mix of conversations and activities filling the room. Rihanna animatedly chatted away to a disinterested moonfish, Kiana sat in contemplative silence, and Ludger sharpened his new cleaver with focused intent. Moonfish retained his jacket vest, a choice not questioned by Izuku, who understood that certain preferences remained unchanged. The room's atmosphere shifted as the awaited figure, the man Izuku had been waiting for, opened the door to the safe, warehouse. Daimai, in his customary uniform, greeted them with a resonant voice, Izuku, long time no see. So, how did the plan go? Izuku responded with a contemplative hum. Most agreed, but some chose the path of the villains. Gaimai chuckled knowingly. It was to be expected. Now, Kagoshima has been properly invaded. Fleet H-1A has already landed. And the airports and harbors have been repurposed for military use. Half of the Miyazaki prefecture has fallen. We're still utilizing World War I and Two-Era weapons. But that's because the enemy is blissfully unaware of the war raging on Kyushu. We need to prepare for the deployment of Cold War-era weapons. Rene, showing her ever-present curiosity, spoke up, and who might you be? Gaimai responded with a measured introduction. Gaimai Krob, just call me Gaimai. I'm the leader of the NCC, not that you could have heard of it. As the pieces of the grander narrative fell into place, the group found themselves aligned with the enigmatic Gaimai, leader of the National Crisis Committee. 
The stage was set for a conflict reminiscent of historical wars, with the promise of evolving weaponry and strategic maneuvers shaping the unfolding events on Kyushu. Now, Gaimai continued, his voice carrying authority, the full deployment of army skull is needed. I hope you know how to lead the army. Izuku responded with a confident nod. Of course, I managed to lead a few companies into the Yakuza compound. This should be similar. Gaimai remained silent, offering no immediate response. But he did say, we'll see. Now then, for the first act of deployment, the Miyazaki prefecture is being handled by two divisions of army Nuremberg. It's best that you focus your forces onto Kumamoto prefecture. Izuku absorbed the information, nodding in acknowledgement. All right, so when will the full force get here? Gaimai answered with a hint of strategic foresight. In a few weeks, the transport fleets are being made ready in Dalian, China, but the full force of Division Spine has already been deployed. The weight of responsibility settled on Izuku's shoulders as he prepared to lead Army Skull into a larger-scale conflict. The mention of divisions and transport fleets hinted at the intricate planning and coordination required for the upcoming operation. The unfolding events painted a picture of a strategic military engagement, with the fate of Kumamoto Prefecture hanging in the balance. As the narrative progressed, the challenges and complexities of leading an army in a time of crisis would undoubtedly test Izuku's abilities and resilience. It was 3.12 p.m. on a serene Sunday. Across mainland Japan, the war between the Paranormal Liberation Front and the combined forces of the police, military, heroes, and law-abiding citizens raged on. However, the island of Kyushu remained relatively untouched. Villains attempting to cross the sea were thwarted, and communication with the heroes mysteriously ceased. The residents remained blissfully unaware of the unfolding conflict between villainy and heroism. Unbeknownst to the authorities, fate had presented another threat, an invasion force that had recently integrated Kagoshima into its march of vengeance. Now, it sought to conquer Miyazaki and Kumamoto. In Miyazaki, the southern part under the Hidetsus River had succumbed to those bearing a golden eagle on their flag. In Kumamoto, the invaders crossed the border, with different companies of Division Spine advancing toward strategic locations. Company 1, 2, 9, and O were marching to Nagashima. Company 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, H, C, P, and Z were headed to Minamata. Company 8, 10, 13, 18, 22, V, B, S, and E were moving to Hiroyoshi. The division was divided into three groups, each equipped with a range of tanks, from Vickers MKE to T-44 second, and artillery pieces including 21 cm Morser 16, cannon to 155mm GPF, 7.7cm FK-16, and K-44. The arsenal comprised vehicles and weaponry dating from 1900 to 1950. As the groups advanced, the outdated military equipment seemed formidable against a city devoid of defenses. The only military posts on the island were in Fukuoka and Saga prefectures. Group 2, marching towards Minamata, reached the city outskirts, setting up artillery posts on hills. M18 inches howitzers and various artillery pieces were loaded and aimed at strategic targets, the police station, hero agencies, hospitals, and other civil services. The objective, disable defenses and divert attention, ensuring that the invaders had the upper hand in this unexpected assault on Kumamoto. The initial artillery salvo, propelled by a 10.5 cm Lef H-18, marked the commencement of the assault on Minamata. The first shell, not hitting any intended targets, struck an office building, causing a devastating explosion. The impact on the 16th floor turned the once 20-story structure into a 15-story ruin, its upper floors crashing down in a cascade of destruction. Following this chaotic prelude, the lines of M18 inches howitzers, M101 howitzers, M1937 howitzers, and other artillery pieces opened fire. This time, the barrage was directed at specific targets, police stations, hero agencies, hospitals, and other civil services. The shelling persisted for three hours, from 317 to 620, wreaking havoc on Minamata. As the echoes of artillery subsided, the motorized infantry took center stage. Panzer IVs, BT-7 seconds, and an array of other vehicles descended from the hills into the city. Some brave police cruisers attempted to form a blockade, but their efforts were short-lived. An FCM 2 degrees Celsius, a formidable armored vehicle, unleashed its firepower, causing the police cars to explode. With the makeshift blockade obliterated, the tanks effortlessly rolled over the debris, clearing the way for the infantry advancing from behind. The invasion of Minamata was underway, leaving destruction and chaos in its wake. The radio transmissions painted a grim picture of Minamata's descent into chaos. Officer Kimura Tetsuya's urgent call for backup near Tojajsen was abruptly cut off by an explosion, leaving the fate of those officers hanging in uncertainty. The hero Infernal's distress call from the Yudo fishing port was met with the disheartening sounds of machine gun fire, followed by ominous silence. A civilian's desperate plea for help, reporting individuals with skull masks, 
ended abruptly with the sound of an unknown disturbance. Taniguchi Makoto, an 110 phone operator for the police, found himself overwhelmed by the relentless stream of distress calls. Every report indicated escalating violence and casualties, with heroes and police already stretched thin across the city. He attempted to contact assistance from Tsunagi, but the lines were dead, cutting off any hope for external support. In the midst of this chaos, Makoto's own reality took a tragic turn. The door to his refuge was violently kicked open, and before he could comprehend the situation, bullets from an STG-44 tore through him. The operator's life was abruptly extinguished, leaving the communication hub in eerie silence, mirroring the unfolding catastrophe in Minamata. Private Helmarsen's voice cut through the radio waves, reporting to Izuku from Company 6. The news was grim, the emergency call center had fallen, and the last operator had been silenced. Izuku, seated under a makeshift command post near the artillery lines, listened intently to the report. Around him, the group majors held their respective ranks, each overseeing a specific group within the operation. Kiana Tsutsumi, now a group major with a gold class rank, sat in silence, her gaze fixed on the ruins of the city. Her expression remained unreadable as the devastation unfolded before her. Rihanna Mead, a GM with a bronze class rank, seemed to be caught in a frenzy of emotions, reacting passionately to the unfolding tragedy. Ludger Barr, a GM with a silver class rank, found a moment of diversion by playing cards with some of the artillery crew. In the midst of this, Moonfish, opting to be addressed by his codename rather than his real name, maintained the rank of major, overseeing Company Z. He had joined his company within the city, seeking the satisfaction of his peculiar desires. Izuku, acknowledging his unconventional request, had granted Moonfish the liberty to indulge in his gruesome pursuit. The city's chaos reflected in the dynamics among the officers, each dealing with the grim reality in their own way as they navigated the complexities of the unfolding invasion. Following the swift fall of Minamata, Group 2 wasted no time in advancing towards the next target, Tsunagi, a city merely 5.3 kilometers away. As they approached, the decision was made to subject Tsunagi to prolonged shelling, a strategic move to maximize the impact of their formidable ammunition reserves. The relentless bombardment was set to endure for three consecutive days. The initial target of the shelling was Shuram Hospital, situated on the outskirts of the city. The strategic positioning allowed for a relatively uncomplicated takeover. From this vantage point, the invaders set their sights on the town hall and its surroundings, initiating the assault with a calculated and relentless barrage of shells. The city of Tsunagi became the next battleground, engulfed in chaos as the invaders executed their systematic plan of invasion and conquest. Company 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 had successfully reached Minamata Marina, a strategic port located in close proximity to Tsunagi. Although relatively small, the port provided a crucial vantage point for the invaders. Utilizing the location, they set up smaller artillery guns, including the QF-18 Pounder gun and the Cannon to 75 Model 1897, which commenced shelling the city. The impact of the shells was immediate, causing sirens to wail throughout Tsunagi. Attempts by a flying hero to intervene were swiftly neutralized by an K-37, leaving the hero's body to sink into the waters of the port. As chaos unfolded in the city, Izuku summoned a formidable force of 200 predators, comprising Siberian and Bengal tigers, Barbary lions, and, with the newly acquired ability to summon extinct species, American lions. Tasked with sowing chaos, the predatory force entered the city amidst the shelling. Their mission was simple, create as much disorder as possible. The shelling temporarily ceased to avoid harming the summoned predators. Once the force of large cats either met its end or successfully completed its mission, the artillery barrage would resume, further intensifying the invasion of Tsunagi. As Izuku studied the map of Kumamoto, he received word that Group 1 had successfully secured Nagashima, albeit at a heavy cost. Companies 1 and 2 within Group 1 had suffered substantial casualties, with 20% of soldiers losing their lives and an additional 30% sustaining various injuries. The Nunatos Bridge, connecting Shaura Island to Nagashima, had been intentionally destroyed by a collaboration of hero and police forces, presenting a significant obstacle. A similar situation occurred on Akara Island. Acknowledging the need for reinforcements, Izuku instructed Group 1 to hold their position in Nagashima while awaiting the arrival of additional Army Skull members. To support the defense, he decided to dispatch an animal force of 600 creatures, constituting a new company, Company CH-1. To reinforce Company H this force included tigers, bears, lions, and wolves of various species. With Company CH-1 and H en route to assist Group 1, Izuku shifted his attention to Group 3. The team assigned to Hidoyoshi had successfully taken control of the city with only a 10% casualty rate. Notably, they had also secured Sagara, and as Group 3 divided into two subgroups, Group 3A and Group 3B, they planned to lay siege to Kuma and confront the forces in Nishiki, respectively. Contemplating the map, 
Izuku acknowledged that challenges persisted, but he felt a sense of assurance that they had overcome some of the initial hardships in their campaign. The fate of Kumamoto remained uncertain, but the tide seemed to be turning in favor of Army Skull. As the campaign in Kumamoto unfolded, Tengu Bridge near Hiroyoshi became a pivotal location. Group 3 successfully crossed the Kuma River, unifying their forces after the fall of Kuma. On another front, Group 2 managed to take control of Ashikita, albeit at the cost of losing Company 5 during a month of intense fighting in the city. A depleted company was replaced with the newly formed Company CH2. However, Group 1 faced challenges in Nagashima. Despite a minor success in capturing Teikshimao Bridge and securing Take Island, the division was largely stuck in the city. Division Spine had reached its limits, and the waiting game had begun. Fortunately, the first wave of reinforcements landed in Akyun, marking a turning point for Army Skull. The additional forces, spanning from Company 23 to 43, were divided, with Company 23 to 30 joining Group 1, and Company 31 to 43 reinforcing Group 2. This influx of new soldiers injected fresh blood into the campaign. Moreover, news arrived that new clone companies, the 15th generation clones, Company Spa, SPB, and SPC, had been created and were en route to Kumamoto from Vladivostok. The deployment of these clone companies signified a strategic move to bolster Army Skull's strength. Although the equipment remained rooted in World War era technology, plans for the integration of Cold War era weaponry were in the pipeline, hinting at an impending evolution in their military capabilities. The fate of Kumamoto was still uncertain, but the arrival of reinforcements and the promise of new units marked a shift in the tide of the conflict. Seated in an office building in Ashikita, Izuku found himself deep in thought, attempting to formulate a strategic plan for the ongoing campaign. The group majors of Group 2 surrounded him, awaiting his decision. Kiana was the first to voice her opinion, suggesting a week of rest for the groups to recover and regain their strength. Izuku pondered her proposal, recognizing the wisdom and allowing time for healing. Rine, on the other hand, had a different perspective. Why not keep pushing forward? We've been on a winning streak, she suggested, displaying her characteristic enthusiasm for action. Ludger, however, interjected with a more cautious approach. As much as I enjoy a good fight, cutting off enemy communications has played a significant role in our success. With refugees spreading the word, we might face coordinated resistance soon. Finally, Izuku shared his thoughts on the matter. We'll wait for now. Once another division of Army Skull lands in the annexed territory, we can resume our advance. Despite the enemy's potential to build defenses, we need more manpower. Losing a company, and possibly two in Group 1, emphasizes the importance of waiting until we have a substantial force. Well then, you are all dismissed. The directive provided a clear course of action, balancing the need for recuperation with the anticipation of reinforcements to bolster their ranks. Izuku sat atop a skyscraper in Minamata, a cigarette dangling from his mouth as he gazed at the ruins below. Memories of his desire to be a hero flashed through his mind, acknowledging that circumstances had led him down a different path. He had no intentions of changing it, and once Kyushu was under control, it would become a haven for civilians, keeping out both villains and heroes. The door to the rooftop opened, and Kiana Tsutsumi stepped out, leaning against the exit wall. They both sat in silence for a moment before Tsutsumi addressed him. Midoriya, I recognize that expression. You're grappling with regrets, she remarked. Izuku responded with a thoughtful hum. In a way, I guess. But dwelling on regrets only keeps you stuck. I'm sure you have your own share, so why not share them? Kiana frowned slightly, contemplating her words. I feel like I'm going in circles, joining one corrupt organization after another, she admitted. Izuku nodded slightly before turning to face her directly. Well then, you're free to leave. Neither I nor Gaimai will force you to stay here. We only want people who genuinely want to be part of this. She sighed, expressing the difficulty of her situation. It's not that simple. For every bad thing the NCC has done, there's another act of good that balances it. Every time I think I've found a reason to leave, I find one to stay. I'm just not sure. Izuku crushed the cigarette under his boot and looked at her intently. Well, I suggest you find clarity in your mind. Soon, you might fall into a rabbit hole, and getting out won't be easy. I'll be seeing you at the main encampment. The conversation had laid out the crossroads before her, emphasizing the importance of finding her own path amidst the complex situation. Kiana watched as Midoriya's figure disappeared down the stairs. The conversation had taken an unexpected turn. She had anticipated either a defense of the crisis committee's actions or an attempt to coerce her into staying, reminiscent of President Nishiyama's tactics with the HPSC. However, Midoriya did neither. He presented her with a choice, a decision she would have to make for herself. Her logical side leaned towards leaving. She knew her departure wouldn't significantly alter the course of the NCC's actions. Yet, an inexplicable feeling lingered, a sense that leaving might be a mistake. She had witnessed the motivations behind this takeover, 
While Gaimai held no intentions of being a beacon of light, Midoriya had strategically orchestrated a situation where, once the island was under complete control, civilians wouldn't be threatened by the PLF and heroes engaging in a civil war. Despite her reservations, she decided to stay. Loyalty wouldn't be directed towards the general director, but rather to the admiral commander of Army Skull. Deep down, she believed he retained some level of morality, and that, she thought, was better than none at all. In the remote region of Bolshoi Shanter, Siberia, Gaimai sat behind a desk within the headquarters of the National Crisis Committee. Following a meeting with Baron Kez of the NCCSC, he had received intriguing information about a new weapon discovered in the old labs of the Institute for Scientific Research in Viruses. Vials labeled C-58 were uncovered, containing a virus with unique properties. This particular virus could spread through the air in a gas-like form. A Dr. David Moss had tested it in 1962, and the results were promising causing skin irritation, infection, and a peculiar attack on the nervous system, particularly the optic nerve, leading to blindness. Now under the control of the NCCSC, Gaimai saw the potential of this biological weapon. He had always held a fascination for such tools. They brought indiscriminate death to both combatants and non-combatants alike, much like his own methods. With the addition of this new weapon, the arsenal of the National Crisis Committee would become deadlier than ever, promising even greater destruction. An albatros sea. IV soared through the sky, its distinctive engraving reading WJJ099830, marking its place in Wing Jingle, Squadron Joe 99. The aircraft glided over the Mizukami Village Hall, where the last defenders, consisting of police officers, Coast Guard ensigns, and local heroes, valiantly held their ground. The town hall was under siege, surrounded by the remnants of the once thriving village. Artillery fire had decimated any hope of retaliation, turning the situation into a waiting game that the town hall was destined to lose. As the Albatros Sea, IV circled around Mizukami, anticipating the moment the NCC flag would replace the last vestiges of resistance. Its pilot, Bert Moore, spotted an intriguing sight in the distance. A convoy of police cruisers, around 20 of them, was approaching Mizukami from what seemed to be the direction of Shiba. Yet, what truly caught Moore's attention was the armored car accompanying the police force, unmistakably from the special assault team. Intrigued, Moore swiftly radioed in the information. This is Airman Burt Moore from Squadron Joe 99. There appears to be a small convoy of police together with Insat car coming. Be ready, he reported over the transmitter. Group Major Kestas Buckus responded affirmatively, thanks for the heads up. From where are they coming? From 142, it appears, Bert replied. All right then, guess we'll have to deal with that. You should go to your superior then, advised Group Major Buckus. With that, Moore's Albatro C. IV executed a turn, heading back to the airstrip built at Issa. Kestas Buckus, recently promoted to Group Major Gold Class of Group 3, had set up his command post in a house in Mizukami. He patiently awaited the outcome of the siege, ready to either witness the last defenders surrender or the walls breaking down under their relentless assault. However, news of Japanese reinforcements en route prompted him to take decisive action. Recognizing that he lacked the time to confront the incoming forces with his ground troops, Buckus quickly reached for his transmitter. He called upon a bomber squadron stationed in Hidoyoshi, under the command of Wing Commander Jackie Savit. The squadron, now part of Wing Janaris with 20 squadrons at their disposal, included two bomber squadrons among them. Wing Commander Savadir responded promptly, assuring Buckus, we'll get there as soon as we can, but do try and block them in somehow. Determined to impede the Japanese reinforcements, Buckus ordered an artillery strike on the road leading from 142. The cannons roared, and just as the police convoy passed Mizukami Produce Market, the leading police cruiser took a direct hit, erupting into a fiery explosion. The resulting wreckage effectively blocked the road, hindering the convoy's progress. Meanwhile, shells rained down around them, making any attempts to escape even more challenging. Back in Hidoyoshi, a squadron of 24 planes prepared for action. 14 bombers, short Sterling modules, and 10 Brewster F-2A Buffalo modules were ready for takeoff. Squadron GA-12, led by Wing Commander Savadir, ascended into the skies, heading swiftly towards Mizukami to engage the approaching Japanese reinforcements. The policemen found themselves in a state of disarray, their plans unraveling unexpectedly. Originally intending to retreat to Kumamoto, regroup, and prepare for a counteroffensive, their journey on Road 142 was abruptly halted by the relentless artillery fire. As they scrambled to adapt to this unforeseen situation, Officer Iwamoto Juru caught sight of a foreboding silhouette in the sky. Dread gripped Juru's gut as he realized the impending danger. He attempted to warn his fellow officers, but before the message could spread, the ominous shapes above released their payload. The bombs descended, and in a deafening explosion, the once promising police convoy was transformed into discarded and twisted metal strewn across the road of Mizukami. 
The NCC forces, with their strategic artillery strikes and air support, had effectively neutralized the approaching reinforcements. In the quiet town of Dolinsk, Guy Mikrov sat in his office, methodically organizing paperwork. The room, filled with the muted sounds of shuffling documents, held an air of calculated calmness. The man at the desk, seemingly unperturbed by the chaos beyond Dolinsk, was orchestrating moves of his own. Kai Mikrov, adopting the guise of Yasuke, had successfully navigated the bureaucratic intricacies of the Japanese government. His company, now under the name of his own alter ego, had managed to slip through the cracks of official scrutiny. The government, preoccupied with the PLF and other pressing matters, had little bandwidth to delve into the intricacies of corporate dealings. As Gaimai continued his administrative tasks, a soft sound disrupted the otherwise serene atmosphere. Eri, the young girl with temporal manipulation abilities, lay peacefully asleep in his lap. Her presence in Dolinsk was a result of the strategic relocation of Division Cerberus away from the front line. Gaimai couldn't help but marvel at the twist of fate that had transformed Eri's perception of him and Midoriya as her saviors. When he initially placed her under the care of Ikade Labs, fear had gripped her. However, with the emergence of the Paranormal Liberation Front, Gaimai had decided to move Division Cerberus to Dolinsk, a relatively peaceful town far from the immediate threats. Uri, with her newfound trust in him, insisted on seeing Gaimai every day. The peculiar bond that had formed between Gaimai Krob and Uri amused him. Despite the complexities of their roles and the uncertainties of the ongoing conflict, a sense of connection had emerged. As he glanced down at the sleeping child, a hint of a smile played on Gaimai's lips. In the midst of chaos, Dolinsk became an unlikely haven, and Eri's presence a reminder that even in the darkest times, unexpected connections could bring solace. The clock on the wall ticked away, marking the passage of time in Dolinsk, a town unfamiliar to many, yet now holding a unique place in the unfolding narrative of the National Crisis Committee's ambitions. Within the fortified walls of an office building in Arrow, Izuku's gaze lingered on the map, the commanders of Army Skull's divisions surrounding him. Toshiro Anakoro led Division Spine, Kikairu Chujitoa commanded Division Fisher, Lawrence Morris took charge of Division Wormfesser, and Elmer Shaboxi steered Division Magi. Months had elapsed since their arrival on Kyushu Island, and their calculated efforts had led to the conquest of Erao to Nakatsu, securing Kumamoto, Miyazaki, and the Oida Prefecture. The government's response and the reaction from villainous factions had been remarkably subdued. A brief siege endured on Shishi Island for two months, a mere inconvenience vanquished with artillery precision. Now, Izuku's contemplative gaze shifted to the next target on the map, Fukuoka Prefecture. A strategic imperative, but awaiting the impending arrival of Division Vertebral and Ulna was paramount. Patience became the order of the day, an acknowledgement of the synergy needed for the forthcoming campaign. In the hushed atmosphere of the command center, Izuku accepted the directive to wait. The dynamics of war unfolded on the map before him, and as the pieces fell into place, Fukuoka would soon become the next pivotal chapter in the unfolding saga on Kyushu Island. Kaimai gradually opened his eyes, finding himself in a room that bore the semblance of an office, a stolid desk positioned before him. As the room materialized, a man entered, clad in an M36 uniform. General Lieutenant Gerber, sir. The soldier saluted crisply. Gaimai's mind sifted through the memories. Gerber, a name he had assumed from 1942 to 1944 during his historical past, observing himself in a mirror, he noted the attire, a waffen rock with a skirmancy, a human disguise, complete with normal skin and eyes. Untera Fizier, Gaimai inquired, prompting the corporal to respond. Untera Fizier Johann Abelm, sir. Gaimai acknowledged with a nod. What is it, Untera Fizier Abelm? He further inquired. Abelm conveyed the situation. There was a group of Soviet partisans captured, sir. We are wondering what to do with them, sir. Gaimai contemplated the information. Very well. Where are these partisans, Untera Fizir? He queried. Abun promptly responded. At the farmer's field outside, sir. Gaimai rose from his seat. Lead the way. Let me see these partisans, he commanded, a sense of authority resonating in his tone. The echoes of a distant memory stirred within him as he prepared to confront the complexities of wartime decisions. Kaimai's gaze surveyed the kneeling partisans before him, six individuals whose fate hung in the balance. Three young boys, aged between 14 and 17, a girl of approximately 16, and two older men, each appearing to be in their 60 seconds or 65 seconds. The atmosphere was charged with uncertainty, and Gaimai took a moment to assess the situation. So, these are the partisans. Are you certain? Gaimai inquired, seeking confirmation from Abel. The corporal nodded in response. Yes, General Lieutenant, sir. They were attempting to sabotage some of the Sonderkraft Fuzzyug 250 tracks, hindering our movement to the front line. 
Gaimai clicked his tongue, his eyes focused on the captives. German, he asked, receiving no reply. Switching to Russian, he posed the question again, prompting one of the older men to nod. HM, so, I believe we all know what is going to happen now, right? The older man nodded once more. Well, nothing personal. Fire. Before the imaginary gunshots could pierce the air, Gaimai found himself abruptly pulled back to reality, seated at his desk in Dolinsk. The echoes of a haunting memory lingered briefly. Eri had been sent to her room a few hours earlier. Time I chuckled at the whims of dreams. It's been a long time since I had a dream. Oh well, maybe next time it will be about that time in Poland. Oh, what fun that was. The summer recollection dissolved in the wake of waking life, leaving Gaimai with the present and the weight of his past. Gaimai surveyed his reflection in the mirror. Witnessing the transformation back to his tar-like visage, eyes returning to the void with snow-white pupils. The shifting appearance signaled the resumption of his true form. Cracking his neck, Gaimai acknowledged the shift with a silent determination. It was time to assess the situation and consider deploying additional divisions in Japan. The report scattered across his desk detailed the current military presence. From Army Nuremberg, Division Honeybee and Digger B were available. Army Skull boasted a formidable lineup with Division Fisher, Spine, Magi, Wormfesser, Vertebral, and Ulna, accompanied by Company 1 and a from Division Cerberus. In addition, smaller wings provided air support throughout the occupied territory, and various clans within the Black Eagle Network contributed manpower to maintain peace on the front lines. Considering the strategic landscape, Gaimai decided to reinforce their forces. Division Horsefield from Army Nuremberg would be deployed as well. He swiftly penned the order, summoned a pigeon, and entrusted the message to the bird for delivery. As the pigeon took flight, carrying the directive to its destination, Gaimai reclined in his chair, contemplating the unpredictable twists awaiting them in the ongoing war. Terentius stood before the portal, the gateway that would transport them to their nemesis. The assembly consisted of the twelve unbeatable angels, with Terentius being one of the originals. Alongside him were Domitius, Duilius, Lucilius, and Traianus among the males. The female members included Drusa, Marina, and Therapia. Petronia and Herminia had fallen victim to it, their replacements being Calpurnia and Ursus. The new recruits, Caius and Honorius, completed the group. Each face bore a solemn expression. The murderer of Petronia and Herminia awaited on the other side of the portal, a foe they were determined to confront. Though the one responsible for Apavatara's demise resided elsewhere, this marked a crucial beginning. Therapia, now the leader, took a deep breath and addressed the group. I understand the gravity of the situation, but we are not undertaking this journey for ourselves. The planet Earth is in dire need of intervention. It is there, and we must halt whatever malevolent plans it has. Now, onwards, she declared, rallying the team for the mission that held the promise of retribution. Back on Earth, Gaimai enjoyed the calmness of his office until an unexpected portal disrupted the tranquility. With a raised eyebrow and a sigh, he muttered, Oh, what is it now? What emerged from the portal, however, was beyond his expectations, figures from Asha and Gra. Therapia, visibly perturbed, entered the room, and as she did, a growl of disdain escaped her lips. You, she uttered, fixing her gaze on Gaimai. Perplexed, Gaimai responded, Me. Lucilius followed Therapia through the portal, his eyes widening at the sight before him. Antidija he muttered, and Gaimai's curiosity deepened. Antidija, eh, haven't heard that in a long time. Now, seeing how both of you look ready to kill me, could you refresh my memory of who you bunch are? Gaimai inquired. The full assembly of the twelve angels stepped out of the portal, and Drusa, with intensity, replied, Apavatara Atma, remember that name. Gaimai's smile faded, and he stared at them. He then clicked his tongue and remarked, Really, you bunch? Last I heard, Earth was off-limits to your phony kind. The Willius shook his head. So, what does it matter what's off-limits? If it wasn't allowed, we wouldn't be able to do it. Gaimai snorted, retorting, if that were true, the creator would have long stopped me. So, Gaimai started, you're all here to kill me. Trianus shook his head and replied, we can't kill you, but we can certainly restrain you. Gaimai chuckled, oh, you mean like last time? That worked out splendidly, didn't it? But here's the deal, you all go back to be Silos, Ashad Gra, or wherever you came from, or I'll deal with the entirety of the Atma family once and for all. Marina scoffed, we're not afraid of you, Intidija. You may have changed your name. But you're still the same entity we sealed away. Kaimai grimaced. Intidija is a name I left behind a long time ago. I've moved on from the Dare family. It's Kaimai now. But if you're so eager to challenge me, then let's settle this once and for all. With tension thick in the air, the angels summoned their weapons, ready for the confrontation that was about to unfold. Kaimai gave a dry chuckle. Wrong move. As he spoke, the walls of the room began to morph, transforming into black slime, and the floor followed suit. From the oozing substance, demonic creatures slowly materialized, their grotesque forms emerging into the room. In Gaimai's hands, a my auto materialized, gleaming ominously. Looks like I'll be calling in some old relatives of mine. 
Ursa spoke up nervously. Um, Therapia, you mentioned that all the members of the Demona clan besides Intitija were dead, right? Therapia nodded, her expression grim. Yes, but there was one other, the one who killed Apavatara. Then, both Gaimai and Therapia uttered in unison, Jujia. A second demon emerged, resembling Gaimai but with two black horns adorning his head. This one, however, had a different aura, exuding an air of darkness. He spoke, it's Mick now, Gaimai. Like you, I've moved on from my roots. Gaimai chuckled, ah, Mick, fancy some fun with Apavatara's spawn. Mick cracked his neck with a wicked grin. Oh, you know it. A battle rapier materialized in Mick's hand, ready for the impending confrontation. Therapia spoke first, her voice commanding authority, Terentius, Domitius, Lucilius, and Traianus will fight with Jugia, Duilius, Drusa, Marina, and I will deal with Gaimai, while Caius and Honorius will handle the smaller demons. Everyone got the plan. The angels nodded in agreement. Well then, attack, Therapia commanded. And with that, the battle erupted. In Therapia's hands appeared the holy rapier, a weapon of divine power. Gaimai, however, wasted no time and struck first, slashing at Drusa's neck. Reacting swiftly, Drusa summoned the righteous longsword, blocking Gaimai's attack just in time. The battle unfolded in a chaotic symphony of clashes and shouts. Terentius, Domitius, Lucilius, and Traianus engaged Jugia, their weapons gleaming with celestial light. Terentius wielded the heaven's halberd, its blade infused with the power of the cosmos, while Domitius brandished the divine bow, raining down arrows of holy fire upon their foe. Lucilius summoned the thunder hammer, crackling with divine energy, while Traianus unleashed the sacred spear, its tip shimmering with divine radiance. Meanwhile, Duilius, Drusa, Marina, and Therapia faced off against Gaimai, their weapons ready to defend against his onslaught. Duilius wielded the shield of the ancients, its surface reflecting the power of the heavens, while Drusa gripped the righteous longsword, its blade cutting through the darkness with divine precision. Marina conjured the frostbow, its arrows freezing the air around them, while Therapia brandished the holy rapier, its point radiating with divine righteousness. The battlefield echoed with the clash of steel and the roar of demons as the two sides clashed. Stay focused, Therapia shouted, parrying Gaimai's strikes with her rapier. We mustn't let him gain the upper hand. Gaimai laughed darkly, his eyes gleaming with malice. You angels always underestimate the power of darkness. He sneered, striking out with his myodao but the angels fought with unwavering determination, their weapons glowing with divine power as they pushed back against the forces of evil. The battle raged on, each side locked in a deadly dance of blades and magic, determined to emerge victorious. Hey Gaimai, Mick's voice boomed over the chaos of battle as he deftly dodged an arrow launched by Domitius. Remember the power Yellub gave me? Gaimai smirked, his eyes darting across the battlefield as he parried Therapia's thrust with his my auto. Ah, yes, a watered-down version of his power, wasn't it? Mick chuckled, his movements fluid as he evaded a strike from Duilius. Not quite, he replied. It's called Demon's Serpent's Creator. Yellup had Demona Creator. And while I might have left the dare name behind, ever heard of Delks? Gaimai rolled his eyes, sidestepping another attack from Drusa. Mick Delks, what a peculiar name. Mick shook his head, frustration evident in his expression. No, Mick Wilders, I'm just the head of the Delks family, he clarified, his voice tinged with annoyance. And where are they active? Gaimai inquired, his curiosity piqued. Mick's expression softened slightly. In Brazil and Peru, I'm staying away from your turf if you're doubting it. Gaimai raised an eyebrow, considering Mick's words carefully. Even Mexico. Mick nodded, his gaze steady. Yes, even Mexico. Anyway, it would be quite fancy if we could even the odds a bit, right? Gaimai chuckled, a glint of mischief in his eyes. Sure, go ahead. But you know what? Let me bring in some of my own. With a flick of his wrist, a bright white flash appeared in Gaimai's hand. He grinned mischievously, then shouted, Hold on. And in the blink of an eye, the entire building collapsed in a blinding white flash, engulfing the battlefield in chaos. Humanoids with reptilian features materialized, each wielding a melee weapon, while shadowy figures emerged from the rubble. The Norius muttered, Hey guys I think they got reinforcements. Therapia nodded grimly. It appears they have. Without hesitation, Drusa launched herself at Gaimai. Her movements swift and determined. There was a sickening splat, followed by smaller thuds, and then a louder one. Drusa's head soared through the sky as Gaimai's Maiato blade was stained with yellow blood. Gaimai grinned, his eyes gleaming with satisfaction. So who's next? Duilius's eyes widened in shock. Drusa, he muttered. You bastard. Drusa shot three arrows in quick succession, but Gaimai effortlessly cut them down with his blade. Oh, what's wrong? You all think I'm still the young demon you faced 4.867 billion years ago. Well, sorry to bust your bubble, but I've evolved since then. I discovered the power that Yellup gave me when he created me. 
In a blink of an eye, Gaimai stood behind Marina and swiftly stabbed her from the cerebellum to the frontal lobe, ending her life in an instant. The air crackled with tension as the battle raged on. With Gaimai and his allies proving to be formidable opponents against the Angles and their reinforcements. As the battle continued to unfold, Mick, also known as Jujia, lunged forward with his rapier, clashing against the blades of Terentius and Traianus. The clang of metal reverberated through the air as sparks flew with each strike. Meanwhile, Therapia, fueled by rage and determination, engaged in a fierce duel with Gaimai. Their swords clashed with tremendous force, sending shockwaves through the surrounding. Gaimai's demonic minions, summoned from the depths of the abyss, joined the fray, overwhelming the angles with their relentless onslaught. Domitius and Lucilius faced off against the demonic creatures, their weapons slicing through the air with deadly precision. Despite their valiant efforts, they found themselves outnumbered and struggling to hold their ground against the relentless assault. In the midst of the chaos, Honorius and Caius confronted the shadowy figures emerging from the rubble. With skillful swordsmanship, they fought back against the dark forces, their determination unwavering even in the face of overwhelming odds. The battle raged on, each side unleashing their full strength in a desperate bid for victory. The clash of steel, the roar of demons, and the cries of combat echoed through the shattered remains of the building, a testament to the ferocity of the conflict unfolding before them. Therapy as frustration mounted as the battle took an unexpected turn. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. They were meant to seal away Gaimai once again and then return to Ashad Gra, victorious. But instead, they were losing ground, slowly but steadily. It was a dire situation, and Therapia felt the weight of responsibility pressing down on her shoulders. In the heat of the moment, she made a critical mistake, leaving herself vulnerable to Gaimai's attack. With a swift and precise movement, Gaimai slashed her wrist, causing her to cry out in pain. Before she could react, his blade found its mark, piercing her gut with a sickening thud. Therapia gasped, her strength faltering as pain coursed through her body. Gaimai's twisted grin taunted her, mocking her defeat. Despite her best efforts, she had fallen into his trap, and now she paid the price. As darkness threatened to engulf her consciousness, Therapia clung to the flicker of hope that her comrades would prevail, even in her absence. With ruthless efficiency, Gaimai dispatched the fallen leader of the twelve unbeatable angles, kicking her lifeless body aside without a second thought. As he turned to face Chaos, the would-be attacker found himself swiftly impaled by a humanoid Komodo dragon wielding a deadly spedum. Chaos's body convulsed in agony before falling silent, his life extinguished in an instant. Honorius watched in horror as his comrades fell one by one, powerless to intervene. Before he could react, another monstrous creature, a hybrid of snake and lizard, delivered a fatal blow, cleaving his head in two with a merciless swing of its machete. Traianus met a similar fate as Mick's strike found its mark, severing his throat with lethal precision. The once formidable group of angles now lay defeated. Their bodies scattered across the battlefield, a testament to Gaimai's overwhelming power. With the last of his enemies vanquished, Gaimai stood amidst the carnage, his expression devoid of remorse or mercy. Victory was his, but the cost had been high, and the echoes of battle still reverberated in the air. The surviving members, Terentius, Domitius, Lucilius, Ursus, and Calpurnia, gazed solemnly at the fallen bodies of their comrades. Calpurnia wasted no time in opening a portal, urging the others to hurry through. Quickly, time to go, we lost and need to regroup, she exclaimed before rushing into the swirling vortex. Terentius cursed under his breath, but Domitius understood the urgency. She's right, he agreed, we need to reorganize our forces before it's too late. With a nod from Ursus, they followed Calpurnia into the portal, leaving behind the scene of defeat. Lucilius, however, hesitated, offering to hold off their enemies for as long as possible. Terentius insisted he go, forcefully pushing Lucilius through the portal before it sealed shut. Now alone, Terentius faced the overwhelming forces before him, his sword drawn in a last stand. But his defiance was short-lived as a swift strike cleaved him in two, ending his life in an instant. Standing behind the fallen angel was another figure, with four white wings extending from his back, adorned in a white robe with yellow lines and a halo hovering above his head. Gaimai's laughter echoed through the air as he recognized the celestial being. Hackdall, never thought I would see you again, he remarked with a smirk. Hackdall sighed, a sense of resignation in his voice. My grandfather would have wanted it if he was still alive. Well then, Antitija, I will see you another time. With a flap of his wings, Hackdall ascended into the sky, leaving Gaimai behind to contemplate their encounter. And now Botan prided himself on his honesty. As a construction worker at Awashima Constructions, he took pride in his workmanship. His family, his wife, Ikakawa Eiko, and their two children, Inao Benjiro and Chibai, were his pillars of support. While his parents resided outside the prefecture and much of his family remained distant, he found solace in his circle of friends. Yet, as he gazed into the eyes of the jaguar looming over the lifeless body of a co-worker, 
His usual certainty wavered, uncertain of how to respond to the harrowing scene before him. The sound of boots echoed through the room as a figure emerged, clad in a gray uniform. A metallic skull mask glinted in the dim light, casting an eerie shadow over the scene. Atop his head sat a field gray Berndorfer helmet, lending an air of authority to his presence. In his hands, he held a Fusil Model 1935 rifle with practiced ease. Well, looks like you've encountered the reinforcements, he remarked, his voice muffled by the mask. Botten remained silent, his gaze still fixed on the departing Jaguar. That's the spirit, the figure quipped, commanding the jaguar to vacate the premises. Leaning casually against the wall, he continued, So, this is a construction project. Botten nodded hesitantly, his voice barely above a whisper. Yes, it was meant to be an apartment complex named after Prince Higashikuni Naruhiko, he explained, his words trailing off. The figure nodded in understanding, his expression unreadable behind the mask. The name's Gunter Friberg. Oh, I mean Friberg Gunter, he corrected himself, acknowledging the Japanese naming convention. Botten responded with a hesitant nod, introducing himself as a now Botten. Gunter let out a chuckle. And would you happen to know who we are? He inquired. Botten shook his head in confusion. No, he admitted. Gunter laughed softly. Well, I can't say I'm surprised. Have you ever questioned why there was a blackout a few months ago? Botten once again shook his head, prompting Gunter to continue. You see, Division Cerberus, though I doubt you're familiar with them, severed the communication lines from Kyushu to the mainland. As a result, they're in the dark about what's happening here. Not that they could do much even if they knew. They're too preoccupied with the Paranormal Liberation Front and all that. Botten's confusion deepened. Paranormal what? He asked, his brow furrowing in bewilderment. Gunter let out a weary sigh. Ah, I keep forgetting that Kyushu is out of the loop on that matter too, he muttered. There's a full-blown civil war raging on the mainland between villains and the government. Anyway, you should probably head home and wait it out. There's a larger force en route here, nodding and understanding. Botten wasted no time in fleeing the building. Gunter hummed a tune to himself as he followed suit, the jaguar trailing behind obediently. Izuku surveyed the devastated city of Amida, the first casualty in Fukuoka Prefecture's invasion. Meanwhile, in Yashitomi, Division Horsefield, along with Honeybee and Diggerby from Army Nuremberg, were pressing into and securing the surrounding territory. Within Amida, Division Ulna, Vertebral, and Spine of Army Skull were consolidating their hold, while others were already making moves toward Miyama. With a distant, almost vacant expression, Izuku took in the scene before him. Amida wasn't the first city to fall, nor would it be the last. 